All right. All right. You're all right. Just welcome to up. Talking Landscape Photography, everybody. Um, tonight we are really excited to have Tom Putt, world famous landscape photographer, joining us. Um, Tom um, is an absolutely fantastic uh, photographer and also a great guy. Uh, so we're really, really uh, stoked to have him with us tonight. Um, Tom's, uh, I guess, based on the Mornington Peninsula and he's recently put out a book around about the Morning Peninsula and also has a gallery down there as well. What's the suburb that's in again? Well, it's in Mornington. Yeah, Mornington it's in the town itself. called yeah. Mornington. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and Tom's really great at aerial photography as well as um, snow photography and you, you kind of name it, Tom's. Oh, a bit of a jack of all trades, aren't yeah, I? I should just pick right. one and stick with it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, can I, can I put my two cents in? Sure. Oh, I knew he couldn't hold back. Yeah, come on. Oh, it's just like, oh, no, I can't. Looks like, oh, you do it. And I was like, oh, no, you do it. So if you haven't been watching our show, you would have seen Tom on many times before. But Tom is um, one of the most colourful and, and vibrant and, and dedicated um, characters in, in the Australian landscape photography community, if, if not the global one. And, and he's produced, what, 14 books now, Tom? Yes, yes. I'm working on number 15. Yeah, done a As huge amount of, of social and video work, and and he's had one of the one of the most prolific kind of social media video uh, campaigns I've ever seen in my life. Which one's <laughs> that? Which one's that? Five years. <laughs> oh right, okay. Just in general, just everything I do. And it's not the shy, not the shy type. Put it that no, way. No, no. But he's what I also love about Tom is he's one of the most supportive characters in the entire industry, and he has everybody's back and everybody in mind. And he does a wonderful job at celebrating all that young up and comers as well as the masters um, to a huge degree. And it's, you know, he's a real gentleman and I miss him. I don't get to see him that much these days. Um, I met him in the very early days at RPP when I looked up to him going, thinking he was one of the great legends. Um, and, and then, under and his then wing I, as a total newbie and, and I got to meet a lot of people. So I'm always grateful, Tom. I, uh, so. I couldn't, I couldn't outrun him in a race anymore. Um, he got me on a workshop once and he never asked me, never asked me back again. So I oh, stop it. Back. Come on. Listen <laughs> to you. I'm never going to live that one down, am I? Oh, we need to, no, got to keep having to, to go with that one. We need to chat about that one over a beer or five or something. Ten stage. years ago. Jesus. But no, anyway, we really, um, we, we thought about who we wanted to and back then. And um, we, we did a bit of a survey recently and we've got some great feedback uh, to help develop the show further. And, and there was definitely a lot more interest in doing geographical shows. And, you know, Tom is, a, is the master of, of the Mornington Peninsula amongst many other places. Um, but that's kind of his home and it's a showcase for his gallery and his latest book. So it made sense to um, get him on board to, to really let us sort of dig deep. And I don't know how many secret spots he's going to let out of the bag. Probably not many, but he, but he might inspire <laughs> us at yeah, the very least right. to, to, uh, to open our eyes to what may or may not be obvious to a lot of people that live in the area and or that haven't really given it the time it deserves. So I'm looking forward to um, getting under the hood of the Mornington Peninsula. Tom Putt. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Luke, for having me along. That's uh, an awesome introduction. I don't know where I go from there, but uh, <laughs> yeah, just want to reiterate again, you know, how much um, I love what you guys have been doing. I haven't always been able to join in on the uh, presentations that you've done last year, but um, you did a great job. You got some really interesting speakers on. I'm sorry to drag the standard down a little tonight, but um, but you guys, just such a nice variety of different stuff, you know, and and getting the, the likes of Kenny D on and, and others has just been brilliant. I, I don't know how you do it, but uh, clearly you've got more clout than I do. But um, but I appreciate- People love to talk about themselves. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> The truth be known, the feedback form um, that I filled out for them the other day, I, I feel like I did hopefully put some sort of constructive feedback in there. But that when it said, "Who would you? What would you like to hear more about, or who more would you like to see?" I just put more of Tom Putt and just copy and pasted that yeah, until I filled the whole box up. You blew and out so, our CSV file. That's it. That's it. It, it. kind of worked because the next thing you know, you're on the next show. <laughs> I know. I know. How good's that? I must try that more often. But. Uh, you know, I appreciate you having me on board, guys. It's an honour and, um, and and I just want to say thanks very much for all the work that you guys are doing too because uh, there's so much benefit to everybody out there watching to be watching this and, the, you know, the other the other presentations that have cropped up, um, you know, since we went in the lockdown or COVID, you know, almost 12 months ago. So I think it's really benefited the community 
and people have just learned so much. And um, and yeah, keep it rolling for 2021. That's for sure, guys. Regardless, yeah, of we're certainly happens. planning to. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we've got we've got plans for you, Tom. So oh god, stay tuned, mate. All right. Well, I'm happy to be involved so long as I I keep my clothes on for most of it. I can I can perhaps share a little later. We can we can but, work with that. And as long as you tell it, you've got to give away your, your hair product secrets, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, you know, a mate of an artist mate of mine who lives right by the, by the gallery, he pops in and every time he pops in, he just goes, What's happening with that hair? He just says, you know, this will be that place and time where you look back and used to come and just think, What the hell was I thinking? Because at the time I thought it looked good, but then later on I'm gonna go, nah, look at that, that shaved undercut look. I'm trying to I'm trying to look younger than I am, and I'm now 46 and 47 this year, and that's just too hard to handle. It's anyway. a, it's a mid age, Tom. I have to say, it's definitely going through a little life midlife crisis, that's for sure. But um, you know, excited to talk to you about the Mornings Peninsula tonight and anything else that uh, you guys want to talk about. Um, I really want to sort of showcase what the Morning Peninsula has to offer in terms of um, locations because I'm. I'm really passionate about it and, and strangely, strangely enough, um, because when I lived up in near closer to town years ago, uh, before moving down here with Mary five years ago, I never used to shoot when I was at home. I'd, I'd go off and, you know, do my own private, you know, shoots and I'd go off and run workshops, but the camera never came out while I was at home, even though there were some reasonably nice to places to shoot, you know, lighthouses, jetties, um, you know, some nice red cliffs around Red Bluff, um, you know, Half Moon Bay, in by Morris, Black Rock, that sort of thing. But strangely enough, it just never, I don't know, it never grabbed me as much as what the Morning to Peninsula has. And so that's been a real shift for me to be able to shoot while I'm at home um, and have all this on my doorstep, much the same as you guys have some beautiful landscapes, obviously Mount Wellington and all those other great places around Hobart and, and right on your doorstep. So, um, you know, it is pretty heavily populated. It's pretty pretty busy these days, particularly with COVID and people not being able to freely travel interstate or internationally. Um, we had a sort of bumper season down here over the summer and uh, it's tend to, it tends to be what people, the, the locals tend to hate that because, you know, there's all these people from Melbourne sort of flooding the morning to miniature and making it really busy and clogging up the roads and stuff. And I tend to sort of hide and put the camera away over the summer period because of that. Um, but then the rest of the time, we pretty much have it to ourselves. And, uh, you know, I can drive half, I can leave here at work at four and be on the back beaches of, you know, Gunnamatta with, with not a soul to be seen and walk for two or three hours like I did the other night and just feel like, I, you know, the, you know what it's like, Paul and, and Luke, you, you know, you just, you, your energy is just restored and your, and your soul has, has drunk, you know, the beautiful surrounds and the environment and everything else and i love that about living yeah. so close paul and to i did a trip of... like that a few weeks ago and that was absolutely magic so yeah, you definitely. need to yeah, do that every now and again pristine beach is not a soul alive it's just it. us it's just amazing and whether i have my camera in my hand or not i really don't care you know it's more about just being out about in that environment and being with your own thoughts and uh really good for for my mental health as well so um you know i i do very much appreciate that and probably take it a little bit for granted and probably don't do it enough, you know, just to walk out the door and go, right, okay, let's go and, and shoot something or somewhere. But I tend well, I, to... I can, I can relate to that quite literally because I, I had four months on on the Rye back beach, got out of Peninsula and, and a winter where, you know, this is 22 years ago. And That's right. I remember just weeks and weeks and weeks of surfing and horse riding and walking and not seeing a single person. This is it. And, uh, and, and that's what, um, I, the more I talk to the locals, the more I'm finding that out because um, here's, here's one I prepared earlier. I did want to talk about this book, not to necessarily promote it, but more just to talk about the process involved. This is my latest book and I called it the summer edition, right? And the reason being is because my book that I did previous to this one was on the morning to Peninsula and it was photographs that I'd taken over 20 years. But when you came to look at the body of work, a lot of it was very dark. It was early morning, late afternoon, you know, those golden hours. And yet clients were coming in, customers were coming in and wanting something, you know, beachy and bright and summery. And I didn't really have a lot of that. And so I said, right, the next book that I do, I'm going to make sure it's all of that. And so this is literally, you know, you flip through this and it's 
And it's full of shots, you know, taken during the middle of the day, which you shouldn't be doing type thing. It's not your traditional landscape book. Every single photo pretty much has somebody or something in, in it rather than a pristine landscape, which again is not my style. It's not my jam. Um, but, you know, sometimes I, I really enjoy shooting this book and then sometimes you've got to cater for what the market wants. And so I, not to say that I, I'm... Tom, you, I you shot that in one but, summer, is that right? 100%, yeah. This was shot... The majority of this book, the majority of this book was shot over like four weeks, which wow. is the quickest I've ever done a book. That's but, quick. but majority of it is aerials as well. And as you know, Paul um, and Luke, when you get up in the plane, right place, right time, you can shoot a shitload of pictures and get some great results. And oh, literally, yeah. this the, 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 the basis for this book was done on the 29th of December 2019, when we had a 35 degrees summer day here on the peninsula, it was a Sunday afternoon, it was dead still and everyone was down the beach. And I decided to hire a plane, go and do some photography. And I haven't counted actually how many pictures in this whole book made up that or, or came from that flight, but it'd be, you know, 30%, 40% maybe. So then you've got like this body of work and you're like, right, I'm, I'm, I'm away, this is great. And the reason I shot it so quickly too was because it was, always tabled to be the summer edition. And I knew that if I didn't get it done by the end of January, everyone would go back to work. Everyone goes back to school. The beaches are packed. That hasn't got that vibe that I was looking for in the book. And so I would have to wait another 12 months. And we didn't have time to do that. The reason we, we decided to go with this book, when I say we, often I'm talking about Mary and I, because I do everything that she tells me to. Um, <laughs> I hope she never gets oh, to watch this. I just this. heard her in the background, just quietly. I, no, I, mean, I hope she never gets to watch this. But, um, but you know, we we published a book before this, as I said, and it sold out within twelve months. We under ordered. We ordered about five hundred copies. We ended up getting six hundred and something, and um, and it sold out in twelve months. And I said to Mary, right, well, let's let's you know reprint that book. And she said, no, I don't reprint it. There were things about it she didn't like or wanted to change. And so with that, we decided to go with a whole new book. And so we had a gallery that basically didn't have a book. And to me, um, just from a commercial and business point of view, which I love talking about also, um, you know, this, is, this, is, this can pay the rent for us. You know, this book, when we're selling it through the gallery here, you know, if we sell a couple of books a day, that pays our rent here, which means that any artwork we sell is just, you know, is, is in our pocket, is cream. It, it takes the pressure off us having to sell artwork all the time. And it's um, also much more accessible to more clients or customers as well, yeah, isn't it? hundred so, percent. You've got to have different price points. You yeah. can't just have everything on the wall at three grand and expect people to come in and buy. It's great to have stuff that this is $75. Um, if you can have stuff less than that, that's good too. You know, and you have different price points and that means that you're hopefully catering for everybody who's interested when they come in. And so it was real, real um, urgency for us to get this book out because we had a gap some sort of February last year all the way through to Christmas where we didn't have a book. Now, thankfully, or, you know, one of the silver linings, I guess, from COVID, which we always try to look for, was the fact that we were closed six months last year. So it didn't impact our, our sort of sales proposition that much in a sense that we were closed. But by the same token, um, I never want that to happen again because, as I said, this book pays our rent. And so we, you know, literally I'm planning for the next book already and, and you'll see photographs from that tonight um, in this presentation, okay. the photos I'll be doing for the next book. So, and again, you know, I was saying to somebody today, um, I'm, I probably shouldn't confess to this. I'm less passionate and, and obsessive about photography than I have been before. So what I mean by that is that it doesn't mean that I don't like photographing. I love it. Don't get me wrong. I'll always photograph. But to me now, I like shooting more with a purpose. So if I'm going out to shoot here on the peninsula, I'll have a, a shot list of places that I want to get to and specific photos that I want for the next book. So I'm not just going to places and going, oh, what's it going to be like tonight? I'm going, right, okay, the weather's going to be like this. I know that I've got to get a shot of X, Y, and Z, and that'll look best in that sort of weather. So, okay, let's pick one of those three locations and go and do that. Sounds like, so, sounds like hanging around Loki. <laughs> right, okay. You know, ma master planner, mate. Oh, yeah, no, right. I think um, it's a bit like when you when you get be become very time poor, you you sort of um, you treat time as a little bit of like you have you're investing it in something, and so you yeah, you sort of want to return on investment uh, in terms of locations yeah. and and timing and that kind of thing, so that you don't need to um, wait around. 
So I'm, I, I'm, I'm a really impatient landscape photographer. You, you saying waiting around is, is like, I, I couldn't do it. Like if, if you said to me, you know, go and wait three hours for the right light at that location, I'd go, well, tell me when the right light's going to be and I'll rock up at that time. And, you know, if it happens within five minutes, I'll be happy. You know? I'm, in. I'm into that, brother. I'm, I'm just not one of these people who's going to go and sit on a, you know, mountain for days on end waiting for that light to Look, burst through. I, I, I don't have I actually the patience. Wonder, I actually wonder if all aerial photographers have the same, have the same <laughs> sort of crossover. I love because that. It's just like there's no waiting around with every time we just like bang, 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 oh, bang. Let's go. Sort of high productivity. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Massive hit rate. Inst instant you know, gratification. Like, instant gratification. You know, yeah. none of this waiting around for four hours and then it might be crap sort of business. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. There might there might be a crossover. It just it just popped into my head then. No, you you're absolutely right, Paul. And you know, one of the things that I love about shooting aerials is that as, as I just illustrated with that book, if you get the right place at the right time, you know, you, you can hopefully nail it. And there's that satisfaction that when you land and you're downloading your photos, you're like, oh God, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. And you know, within a, that was an hour and a half, two hour shoot that I did for that first flight. And the number of photos I got to form the basis of the book was incredible. So it just gave me that encouragement to keep going. And yes, I was on the right track. Um, great, I'm going to finish this book. It's a realistic time frame, et cetera, et cetera. And, yeah, it gave you the baseline and, to build around by the sound of it. Absolutely, 100%. And, you know, then it was just um, we're getting probably a bit off topic, but when, the way I plan a book project is to say, right, what's the theme? And then, right, what are the photos? And so, therefore, I was looking at all the photos I wanted to get and basically ticking them off the list. I know it sounds a little bit crude, but it's like a shopping list and you're going through and going, right, still got, those, still got three or four places to go. Yeah, let's do that. And then you're like, right, happy days, let's put the book together and go. And so it was probably a bit unusual for anyone to be able to self-publish a book that within 12 months you've sort of thought of the concept, you've shot the thing and then you've produced it, you've printed it and you've imported it and um and got it you know on the shelves within 12 months so i like the idea of perhaps doing that for the next one as well because otherwise otherwise if it drags on too long also i'll start to lose um interest in the in the whole thing altogether and it might never see the light of day there's there's books on my bookshelf that or the, you know theoretically like my wilson's prom book my snow book which is finished but i just haven't printed it you know there's various books that i've been thinking about doing over the years that i still haven't done because there's just not, I've lacked the motivation or there's not the purpose there anymore or, um, you know, it's just not the right time, things like that. And besides, they're expensive. You need to you need to have money to be able to do all this stuff. So, Tom, I like that might be a good segue into the morning to Peninsula. So if you're <laughs> well, that's right. that's talking, you're talking about this, these these places you want to hit, yep. did, you, did you have a, a broader categorization or you just had a physical list of places or you visualized what would speak more about summer relative to the other book you've done and, and changed your target because of that to emphasize certain areas or. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Probably a lot of all of that, Paul, to be honest, you know, I've got certain places in mind and I know um, what's going to look good as a summer photo, you know, and therefore I'm looking out for that. I've, I've got a strong visualization about what's gonna, what it needs to look like, but then things crop up you know, where you might be on a location and you go, right, I've got that shot, but oh my God, look at that. You know, like I was down shooting um, Point Nepean one early one morning and all of a sudden a cruise ship comes through the heads and you've got your little flying camera out, otherwise known as a D-R-O-N-E, and off you go and you start chasing a cruise ship through the heads and that forms a beautiful double page spread for your book and that's like, oh, bonus. I never, there's lots of serendipitous things came up producing that book like that where, I was out shooting one picture and ended up getting three or four. And, and in essence, um, what actually happened, I don't shoot a lot of drone pictures and, and I mainly do it more for video just because I love that. I love the video component and I thought, oh, I'll put it on a TV here in the gallery and that'll really showcase the peninsula and help sell you know, my product and help sell the peninsula. And instead, I'm, I'm using the drone more and more to shoot stills and... Um, and, you know, get, you know, two or three shots rather than just one that I had in mind. And in doing so, what happened with the book ended up being 50% um, drone and 50%, you know, from planes and helicopters rather than the sort of small fraction that I thought drones would take up. Oh. So, yeah, it ended up... But what do you think there was, Tom? Oh, because, you know, you'd be in a place to get a certain drone shot. You know, there's, there's a couple of locations like Point Nepean and McRae Lighthouse that I've shot from the air before and I'm just way too high. 
and yet on the ground it looks like rubbish too. So I need to be up a little bit higher knowing that I need a drone. I was at those places and then, you know, you shoot one shot and you've got that nailed, the, the, the one that I've visualised, and then all of a sudden, you know, something else comes available and you, you shoot a great picture of, you know, the cruise ship coming through the heads and you're like, oh, I have to put that in the book. And then, and then there's another drone picture that's gone in the book that you didn't expect. So um, they're bonuses. They're good bonuses to have, you know. So... You, um, using a Mavic 2 Pro? What are you I am, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm just so impressed with the quality. Um, in the book here, you will struggle to go through any of the double-page spreads here, which most, which it all is, and, and pick which one's a drone and which ones are the plane shots, for example. Even I'm shooting on a 50 megapixel, you know, Pentax high-end digital camera, um, you, would, you would struggle to pick them. And, and yet, um, recently, I just put together a 200 centimetre wide um, panoramic stitch from the book. Um, it's actually this shot here. And, uh, and I've got it on the wall here in the gallery as a panoramic format. And the, the quality is outstanding. Like you, you cannot, I personally, if you said to me, what's that shot with? I'd say that's not shot with the drain because the quality is too good. And yet- Is that like um, a nine image stitch or? I don't think it was even that, Paul. You know, like when I tend to do my horizontal panos, they tend to only be about six frames even, you know? With the oh, you overlap. do them manually? Like yeah. The, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah I do. I, I, I know it's got the functionality to do it otherwise, but I don't know, it, does it work any better? I tend to just- Oh, it works sort of pretty like, good. Like yeah, I tend yeah, to just I really well. Lightroom stitches them really, really well as well. Right. What yeah. difference is it using it manually and just rotating the drone versus using the software it's to do probably it? Probably a lot faster. Right. Um, and you, like it's you just the, where, the drone where, where, knows where. what the overlap is, so you don't yes. have to worry about missing a you know buggering right. up the, the overlap is probably the key thing. Does it just do a single row or can you do multi rows? Uh, so you can do a what, uh, three by three, yes, and also do a seven by three. Oh, wow, okay, that's a, a 180 degree pano essentially, right? Yeah, nice, yeah, yeah. So, give it a whirl, Tom. I, you might be you might save I'm, yourself I'm, a lot of time. <laughs> have to um, and the other thing you can do, Tom, as well, is like if you use, if you use the non, a non DJI app, you can actually do a HDR panorama as well, so you right. can shoot into the sun and not worry about get, getting oh, blown out. That's what and I mean, and can actually stitch HDR panos as well, so. Yes, of course it can. Yeah, yeah right. Leech, um, leech that's, or a, something? that's a pretty yes. good thing to play with. Yes, that 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 leech or I've, that, that uh, yeah yeah right. Oh, that's great to know. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. What I was going to say is I really miss the um, that portrait functionality that your drone used to have, Luke. Oh they yeah, no, the Mavic one. I, I miss it so much as well. Such yeah. a shame they took that out. Yeah. Why, why yeah. did they do that? I think the the Mavic One gimbal was very very um, fragile. And right. They had well, I, I personally had gimbal problems with it, and, I, and other people it did as well. Right. And if you compare the Mavic One to the Mavic Two gimbal, the uh, yep. Two is just so robust. Right. But um, that doesn't really. Um, it, they could have still put some sort of functionality in to spin the internal camera or something like that, yeah. rather than the gimbal, perhaps. But. Yeah, they, they um, yeah, but Which, uh, that's would, probably one of the reasons anyway. Yeah, would you argue that the, the pano um, stitches that you got out of the one were better than the two? Oh, two's better, regard? definitely. Two's better. Yeah, yeah I, I find okay. that, um, I've also got the Mavic 2 Air and I still prefer the Mavic 2 Pro um, to okay. the, with, with, the, with the panos. Um, I, the one issue Tom with the panos on the Mavic 2 is you, it basically is running off a straight horizontal and it drops yes. it below. So if you want a really big foreground, it's or you want to have an element of your, the the stitch that's quite looking quite vertically down, it's not going to work. You can right. do that. You're going to have to do that manually. Yep. Yeah, you can do. Um, you can do. You can uh, tilt the three by three panos down, but you right. the one eighty pano the gimbal will automatically go up to the horizon and, and only do that. But with the with the three by three, that which is called, I think it's just called horizontal. It just um, goes down. Um, you can sort of adjust the angle. So yeah, it's pretty okay. pretty good to play with. I'd recommend it. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I should share the screen and start showing some yeah, pictures. That, what do you that, think? Sounds good to me. Maybe yeah, everybody. Have, have you got a, a, a maybe part of that or before that? I'd love to just see a map of the peninsula and get a lay of the land. So. I am um, Paul. You've read my mind. 
I'm 100% going to do that uh, right now and show you that. So just let I'm me know. I'm going to spot the uh, Rosebud Pizza Joint where I, oh, yeah. I work for $4 <laughs> an hour for uh, a month to get my um, ferry, ferry money to come to Tasmania 22 years ago. No way. With so my, you're with my three university degrees. <laughs> you're seeing my screen there? Yep, yep. All good. Mel stuff. Melbourne, obviously, right? Smack bang in the middle here. I used to live up here in the Bayside area, about sort of half an hour south of town. Mary used to live um, up here in sort of Essendon, you know, north oh, of the city. And when we came to move in together five years ago, raise our uh, five kids together, um, we thought about moving sort of somewhere in between around South Melbourne, poor Melbourne, but ridiculously expensive for us. And so she said, What about Mornington Peninsula? And I just went, Oh my God, what a perfect choice. And so we moved her kids down here to be at, um, at school here in Mornington. And this is where we live now, although we've also lived in uh, Mount Eliza and also Mount Martha. So this sort of area is you know, where the majority of people who are on the peninsula live. Here's Frankston, for those who probably know it fairly well. And, and I guess what I love about shooting on the peninsula is that there's just so many options to shoot. And so it's one of the few places in Australia where you can actually go to the, um, to the eastern side here and shoot over water, looking across Western Port Bay from Hastings and, um, and, and Flinders, et cetera. Because even though this distance between Flinders and Phillip Island and Hastings and French Island doesn't look very far, it in fact is. So you sort of struggle to see the land in the, in the distance there. And so you can shoot sunrise over the water and then jump across this side and shoot sunset over the water as well, either from the bay here or on the back beaches here, which are particularly good in summer because the sun is coming in on this mm. perpendicular angle. The sun's setting down from here in the bottom left-hand corner, and it really penetrates in a lot of the coves and the bays, etc., along that side. Mm. Um, in the winter, it's sitting more over the land over here, and it's on a more of an acute angle. So there's literally places that I earmark to go and shoot in the summer, but not in winter, and vice versa. The other great thing about shooting on the peninsula is that not only you've got a whole lot of coastline to explore, but um, there's some really nice hinterland with Red Hill and some really amazing forests that I'm starting to find. But also too, if you're if you've got a crappy day and you're like, um, right, I don't want to shoot on the back beaches today because it's howling southerly and it's just unbearable, but it is nice to go and shoot some light on the northern section. Well, you jump across here, which can sometimes take a little no more than 10 minutes and all of a sudden you're on this um, very, you know, um, protected area on the northern side and vice versa. If you've got a howling northerly, you can jump on the back beaches here and get some really nice shots of, you know, the guys down at Gunnamatta surfing the waves and the northerly is pushing the spray off the back of the waves and it looks awesome, right? And so it's really got that variety um, to be able to shoot with and so you can pretty much find anything to shoot in any, any type of weather all year round. That's what I'm trying to say. They call it the back beaches just because, you know, the, they, they refer to the, you know, the main beaches as the one around Rosebud and all of that. And so it's because it's behind that. They yeah. Call it. And well, these are known as the sort of front beaches because yeah. they face the front. And I guess that's facing Melbourne yeah. as opposed to the back beaches, yeah. that are, you know, at the back, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. I've never really thought too hard about it, but yeah, I guess that's the reason why. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, what else should I say? You know, You've got an amazing area. lighthouse there too, Cape Shank. Cape Shank Lighthouse is, is beautiful. And the, yep. and the pulpit rock formation. So a few really awesome sea stacks along that coastline. Correct. Yeah. And I just, I don't have it loaded on this computer, but I went down there last night and actually shot with the uh, drone from pulpit rock down low with that in the foreground, looking back to the lighthouse. So it's from a south southerly direction, looking north, not something that I've seen many people do. And uh, something that came to my head the other day um, because um, you know, do you think to yourself, right, there's over 100 photos in this book that I've just done. How many more shots can you get? Well, obviously, there's, there's lots. It's probably only limited by my imagination. But I am revisiting some places that have appeared in the book already, but I'm trying to put a different spin on it. And, um, and what I probably didn't get around to before in a conversation we were talking about was I called this one the summer edition. And now when I sell it at markets and through the gallery here, people say to me, Oh, so like, are you going to do a winter edition as well? And I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, I'd love to do a winter edition because here on the peninsula, like the winter is just as exciting as the summer in terms of photography, even more so, you know, dramatic storm fronts, clouds, um, waves, et cetera, et cetera, that, um, you know, you, Melbourne doesn't tend to get because you're further south than what Melbourne is. And, when, you know, for those who don't know the peninsula or, or Melbourne very well, a 
lot of people have holiday homes um, in, on the peninsula around Sorrento, you know, Portsy, Blairgowrie, Rye, et cetera. And it's only an hour to an hour and a half to drive to those spots. And, um, and what was I going to say? Uh, I've lost my complete train of thought. Um, but what I'm trying to say okay. is, is that, um, you know, you can, you can jump here into the back beaches here and have a play in the, in the wintertime. And it's just as exciting. And there's still people that come down and have their holidays, you know, in the wintertime, particularly with COVID and everything else. Um, but I love the peninsula more in the winter than I do the summer. I think, you know, if I had a house down, you a can nice get a car park. <laughs> yes, you can get a car park. <laughs> and you don't have to wait hours for a bite to eat or your fish and chips. But the idea of, you know, having a, having a, a, a line and a good book to read while it's pelting down with rain and blowing a gale outside and you're, you're tucked in amongst the tea tree here down here on the peninsula is just my ideal of bliss, you know? A good book, a good girl, and, uh, and maybe some photos to edit at the same time. Sounds like a plan. So that'll come. That'll come. It, it, it surprised me when I lived down there in winter just how wild it felt. I mean, I was down the Gunnamatter end and along that less populated coast, but uh, most of the houses were tucked away in the bush and... yeah. You know, it was such raw, open, wide, expansive feel about it, and yeah, and it feels it felt quite. I mean, again, this is 22 years ago, but it felt pretty underdeveloped. Uh, but I'm also aware that it, it's very much a time of year thing as well. It's it's very broody kind of place, and it's it's a wild place to surf too. Actually, it's got crazy rips and huge waves, and it's quite different from the Torquay coast straight across the other side, which is very groomed and organised. Right, uh, and the Gunnamatta coast is very raw and wild. And what about the Gunnamatta? Is that up near Port Nathan? The Gunnamatta is down here, um, oh, right. right near Cape Shank, in oh, right. Luke. So it's one of the it's one of the gnarliest places to go surfing and to actually go oh, yeah. body surfing as well. It's like there's been a lot of drownings there. It's there's, it's full of rips. Um, right. If I zoom in right. here, um, you'll see this is Cape Shank here um, with the lighthouse that you were talking about. Bush Rangers Bay, which is another great spot. We'll go there soon. Um, but then here's going to matter Ocean Beach here. There's okay. a couple of car parks here. But as you can see, even just from this satellite picture, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's some really interesting stuff that happens in Oof. there, like everything without a wave. Oh, yeah. It's basically a rip. So there's a rip there. There's a rip there. There'll be another rip there. Uh, there's another rip there. So like you just don't – another rip there. So there's like four or five rips just along that beach at any one time. And so it's not a place to go if, um, if you're not an experienced swimmer and you, you probably wouldn't go there. Um, if you just want to go for a swim, um, you, you definitely want to be swimming between the flags, so to speak. So um, I've explored a lot of this coastline. In fact, um, the other night when I went down the beach, I went from Gunnamatta and walked all the way here to uh, Fingal Beach over this way. So essentially I've walked pretty much the whole coastline now. Um, a few years ago, I went and walked um, Rye Ocean Back Beach, which is here, um, all the way to um oh, it's gone zoom in, all the way to um point of and back again all in a day so that was about oh, a big day. two kilometers something like that yeah i started at like sort of nine in the morning so I walked from here and then all the way to um london bridge lookout here and then back again in a day that was pretty full on i was looking for scouting for locations for new locations to shoot so um it's a it's a really awesome coastline and um and there's lots of hidden gems along there that I'll show you a little bit of tonight. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, shall we get stuck into it? Um, yeah, absolutely. What other things? You know, Point of Pean down here at the end, which is where the heads are, which is where all the ships come in. When the ships come in, um, you know, cargo ships, cruise ships, etc., they come in in between Point Lonsdale here where there's another gorgeous lighthouse. Um, Point of Pean, there's no lighthouse here. Um, and they come in and they immediately have to turn right and go through this channel here and around what's called the South Channel Boy or Marker here because there's all of these shallow waters, Mud Island, et cetera, here, which is very treacherous. And then literally they, they, they take this bend and they head straight up the bay here all the way up to the docks here in Melbourne. So um, that, that makes for some pretty cool shots if you can get to a spot called Arthur's Seat. Um, which is here. So how, which is, how far can you actually get down? Because the end of the tip is run by the military. So no, you, it's a national park, and so you can actually get in there between six a.m. and six p.m. But oh, so, but it's talk. a twenty-four hour uh, national park, so you could walk in at any time, and you can walk out at any time. There's just a road that goes pretty much to the end. Um, so uh, you know, you're entering in here. If you get in before 6 p.m. or after 6 a.m., you can drive all the way here to this one called Gunners Cottage, 
And then from there, you can either walk out to the end, which is probably half hour, 45 minutes, or you can take your mountain bike in the back of the car and you can just ride along the road, which will oh, take great. you 15, 15 minutes. Lots of great little spots to stop. Tom, do you know the there was a, there's a famous wave on the end of that tip? Um, well, I didn't know it's about much about it until I actually went and shot it the other day because some guys were surfing it. Yeah, it's this break here, right? Yeah, it, it has to have a pretty large swell in a certain direction, and it's 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 obviously hugely affected by the current. So if you get the timing wrong, you're going to end up in Tasmania. Um, right. And I think it's quite difficult to stay in position because of how much current's moving through the obviously moving opening of this huge bay. Yeah. It's such a massive amount of water moving around. So. Uh, and obviously, you know, with the having to walk all out there as well, it's quite a commitment. A lot of guys uh, will take boats out there, but you've really got you've only got a few hours, maybe uh, right. in very very specific conditions, to be able to surf it. Um, right. I was actually chatting with one of the surfers um, in the car park the other day when we were down there. It was a beautiful night, low tide, and some guys were surfing it. And I said, "Oh, it looked pretty busy out there today. There might have been fifteen people." And he goes, "Oh, not not compared to the other day. There were sixty people." And they're oh, trying to catch that break. 60 surfers, oh can you imagine? God. Yeah, yeah. So I actually think I've got some of that, one of those photos. It's going to be part of the new book um, here in the presentation. Let me just jump into uh, the new book. So this is our structure, my, you know, Lightroom catalog. I've got a Lightroom catalog specifically for the Mornington Peninsula. And, um, and I, I'm actually repopulating all of these collections, but basically it means that if somebody comes into the gallery and says, oh, have you got any pictures of Arthur C? I can go into my Arthur C catalog and show them. But this is, this is the break that you're talking about, Paul. Yeah. So um, this was shot with a drone. There's Point One Star Lighthouse over here. And there's those boats that Paul was talking about and the guys catching the break there. So, yeah, that's the little spot. Um, what else can I say? Um, well, talking about... Talking of Cape Shanks, so to speak, um, I don't know where should we start. Doesn't matter, does it really? Oh no, doesn't just matter. show some pretty pictures, Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I hope I can do that. Um, this is this is Cape Shanks, but the, the 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 sort of tip that people were, guys were talking about with the beautiful lighthouse. This is a moody shot that I took in um, in winter um, a few years back. I haven't finished processing all these as well, so there's some horrible stitch marks and 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 spots and stuff like that there, guys. So please uh, just excuse that for the minute. But um, there's this beautiful black rocky beach which gets some really interesting kelp on it. And at a low tide, you can walk around this beach and you can get over here and face pulp a rock and get some really interesting um, rock pools, etc. in the corners. Um, that's one shot that um, I took with a mate of mine, Sean Farrow, a few years back. Yeah. Um, we ended up backed up into the cliff area because these waves were like pushing right up on us. Um, it was pretty bloody gnarly. We kind of had nowhere to go. But there's um, there's some interesting and deep rock pools over here on the right hand side, which again you've got to be wary of because you might see you might not see them. You, you see this sort of flat water and you think it's okay. You think it's just a rock shelf, but in fact, flat still water is the worst thing down here in on the peninsula because it generally means that there's very deep water underneath. If you see ripples on the water or you know, rocks sticking up, that's great. Stick to that stuff. But it, it's like its like a flat piece of ice. You're just going to end up submerged and uh, drown your gear and uh, get into a lot of trouble if, you, uh, if you're not careful. So you, you, You've had that experience, haven't you, Tom? <laughs> um, I drowned it. Well, I, I, I haven't drowned a camera in those rock pools. I did drown a camera on the peninsula a few years ago where I was running a, a, a steel wool workshop and we were doing the last shot for the evening um, on this pier and I was using a, a, a second, I was using my second tripod, which was an older one. One of the clips broke and um, in doing so, it tipped the tripod with the camera into the drink and uh, I dived in to grab it. And by that stage, it was, it was just far too late. So I drowned a um, $10,000 camera, um, but uh, nonetheless, um, I had insurance, which is what everyone should have. So thankfully it didn't, didn't matter too much, but it was devastating at the time, it was yeah. terrible. Another spot that is sort of similar to Cape Shank, but around the corner a bit more than not many people know about is a place called Cairns Bay. And um, this, is, this is a spot that you can get to um, at a really low tide. Not many people get down there. You sort of go down this cliff edge and there's this really nice little rock that, um, you know, is great, again, to drone through and drone around. It's not terribly tall, but if you get down there at the right tide, you can, um, you can get a shot similar to this. And I'm not, I haven't published this yet and this will probably go in the next book. 
for example. Let me see if I've got another shot of Cairns Bay here to illustrate what that looks like. Um, I don't necessarily. It was in the first book. So I'll leave that for now. Bush Rangers Bay is that spot that I was talking about, oh, yeah. just adjacent to um, Cape Shank. Um, this is um, not easily accessible in a sense that it's easy to get to, but it just takes a bit of a walk. You can walk from the Cape Shank Lighthouse uh, along the cliffs and down to this spot, which will take about an hour, or you can park it back on the road um, on Bonio Road and you can walk through some really nice tea tree and, uh, and get to this same spot at about the same time. Actually, it takes about 40 minutes to get to this spot. And, Is that uh, a natural arch there? That's a natural arch, yeah, 100%. And so you can, at a low tide, you really want to go down here on a low tide and actually in summer because you won't get this shot in winter because the sun is setting too far around behind you. So in summer, about four weeks around the solstice, the sun is actually setting over the sea. The rest of the time it's hidden by Cape Shank behind you. So it's actually mm. setting early, so to speak. And so this is a very much a, let me see if I've got the date. Yeah, this was taken on the 10th of January, uh, 2019. So at 8.20 in the evening. So A, you have to, be there quite late, B, you have to be there around the, the summer solstice, and then C, you're obviously walking out in the dark. But you can get some really interesting shots here. Um, I'm actually, this is not a drone shot, I'm actually standing on top of a rock here. So um, I'm not sure if I've got another shot to illustrate it, but there's actually a big, a big sort of rock that you can climb to get up high to get this shot. And, uh, and this is a magical little spot to get to. And in fact, you can get a shot of that, um, of that archway as well. And I want to find that because um, that did appear in the latest book. Um, let me just go into the other spots and see if I can find that. Any, any questions, guys? Uh, here it is here. Yeah, so that's oh. it just pop. Yeah, so that's that. Again, you know, um, you want to be careful around this area, rogue waves. Um, somebody drowned here just recently. So, yeah, please be careful, everybody. My word of warning is don't ever turn your back on the, on the waves. Um, don't ever take it for granted. You've always got to have an exit strategy. Um, always stand back and observe the ocean before you go closer and then always have an exit strategy. I always have my camera, back, camera backpack on. I've always got my shoes on. I've got my tripod ready to go. And if I need to go, I know where to go. I'm, I'm like, right, if I get caught out here, where can I go? And if, so I'll go there and that'll, that'll get me high enough to, to probably get past any wave. But then I'm like, okay, what's plan B? What happens if I don't get there? What am I going to do? Right, I'm going to shed my backpack. I'm going to drop my tripod and I'm going, to, I'm going to scramble up the rocks here, you know? And worst case scenario from there is that I start to have to shed, shed you know, shoes and clothes to, to rescue myself because sometimes I'm not here with anybody else. And, uh, and I want to make sure that I get home to, you know, Mary and the kids um, rather than um, them having to, you know, find me the next day type thing. And one thing I do always do is ping Mary my WhatsApp location when I'm at these spots because, again, I, I don't want, you know, her to go alert the authorities and them to say, well, where is he? When did you last speak to him? And she's like, well, I don't know where he is, you know. So I'm very conscious of just being, um, being safe and responsible in that regard. Um, Amazing. Again, how that basalt sort of, I think it's basalt columns are just coming yeah. straight out of the top. Um, Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And you know, the banding that you get of the rock here, it's quite incredible. The, the geology of the Mornington Peninsula is really interesting. From Cape Shank to the east, it's all this volcanic basalt. And yet from Cape Shank to the west, it's all that, you know, beautiful, you know, limestone, sandstone, whatever it is. And so it really changes when you get to this spot here. And in fact, um, I've used that to my advantage over the years where, um, there's one of my favourite shots here. The, again, this is in the Cairns Bay area where um, it's called Waterfall Rocks, this one here. So this one here is um, taking that contrast between the rock and the sea in order to get this really nice almost black and white shot. So it'll just pop in a minute. Um, so you've got this, this shitty winter's morning where I was out shooting and I noticed that the, the, the water was pouring off these rocks and, um, and in doing so, creating this sort of waterfall effect. And so I called this one Waterfall Rocks. Um, I'm standing on the, 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 um, the rock platform. The waves are sort of crashing to my right. Um, there's no risk of me really ending up anywhere in the ocean as such, because as you can see, it's over here. Mm. It's shitty that it's not loading. Sorry, guys, it will. It's, a, it's a, obviously a massive right. fire. Oh, there you go. 
It's 24,000 pixels across its TIFF. Um, this was uh, pretty much the day, it, w- it was early morning, you know, the next storm front would come through, drench me, and then, you know, I'd have an opportunity to shoot. And this didn't take long to get, but when I was shooting, I noticed that there'd be times where the water had come off this set of rocks really nicely, but then it wasn't doing the same in the background. And I didn't want to cheat. I'm not, I'm not critical, but I'm not, I'm not a big fan of composites. I just think the skill for me as a landscape photographer is to capture it all in the one image. And so I just kept shooting and shooting and shooting until I knew that I got this shot where you've got the water pouring off the rocks in the background as well as the foreground. And this is not a terribly long exposure either. These rocks, these, these waves were bashing into these rocks, spilling over the top, pouring off, and then within a couple of seconds disappearing again. So this exposure, um, it's going to make a liar out of me. No, it's not. It's less than one second. Yeah, it's 16 on ice 100. Yeah, so people come into the gallery and see this on the wall and they're like, oh, is this like a really long exposure? And it's like, no, no. Oh, I'd say, no, you wouldn't get that detail in that photograph um, with a really long exposure. It would all go really, you know, like this. It would really go murky and milky and you wouldn't see this beautiful. Yeah, it really needs to be sub one second to to have that detail. Yeah, Yeah, you know, and you need to play with that. There's no right or wrong, as in sometimes you can't sort of predict that. You've just got to go with what how fast the water's moving. So it's not a standard, right, if you shoot five seconds, you always get this type of shot. It really depends on what the, the water's doing, as we, as we Yeah, I, I find it a bit of a, a head screw sometimes about which, which shutter speed to sort of go for because it's so specific to an exact moment. Yeah, it's a bit of a trial and error, really, don't you? you sort it, of... it is. It is. Sometimes you get it wrong and you go for the long one thinking that's going to be right and you look on the back of the camera and you go, absolutely not. I've got no detail in this water. That's not the shot I'm after, you know. And, and often I can pre-visualise what, what it needs, what I want it to look like. And that makes it a hell of a lot easier to then execute because then you can go, right, okay, let's go faster, show the speed. No, I've gone too fast. All right, somewhere in between. And you're just, you're just practicing until you get the shot you want, really. Because yeah, that's what interesting you- too, because if you went with a longer shutter speed, it would obviously smooth it all out. But then that probably gives more of a feeling of calm. And that's really not what you want with this. <laughs> you kind of want that dynamic feel to it. So Yeah, and also yeah. too, you probably wouldn't get that beautiful detail in behind the rock as well. You know, look at that stuff in here. It's just bloody glorious, right? Yeah. I just love that yeah. stuff in there. You know, oh, it's yeah. just, it's lovely. And we've printed this as a, as a big two meter acrylic. And put it on the um, gallery wall, and people just love it. They just they're like, "Where's that taken?" You know, they can't believe it. So, so how yeah. do you how do you treat your exposure when you have such high contrast? contrast? Well, like, I'm, I'm yeah, like, great question. Like, I'm always just exposing it for the highlights as much as I can because you obviously don't want to blow out the highlights. So I've got to make sure that I'm not overexposing. But then the more I can push the histogram to the right towards white, it's opening up these shadow areas here. So I'm not making these black. If I badly underexpose these photos, I'm not going to see all the detail here in these darker areas and therefore it's, it's, it's going to look a bit rubbish. I don't mind this in here because even with the naked eye, you wouldn't see detail under that rock ledge. But in other places, I mean, can you imagine trying to shoot this on bloody slide film, transparency film 20 oh, years ago? Yeah. You wouldn't bother. You really wouldn't Fuji bother. Velvia. rubbish. Fuji Velvia with four stops latitude. Thanks very much. I am shooting with the, the Pentax 645Z. It's a medium format digital. It's got a huge two and a you know, quarter inch sensor. The dynamic, dynamic range is, is more than enough. And in fact, most of the time it's too much. I'm adding contrast and particularly with my aerials, I'm adding dehaze to, to add the contrast into the photo because it's too flat otherwise. You know, well, I, you've I hate been HDR. For a long time. You're you going to stick with it? Yeah, 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 100%. I just bought myself a new lens um, the other day for it. Um, I am going to stick with it. I, I don't have the money in order to have the inclination to go anywhere else. Um, that Fuji, you know, they're doing great things with their cameras with the 50 and the 100 megapixels. And um, and it's tempting. No, it's not even tempting. It's, it's great. I'd love to be able to, you know, upgrade, so to speak. But what am I buying? I'm buying like a, a camera with some bells and whistles, but then I'm, it's still got the, the same sensor in it that, that the Pentax does, I believe. So... Um, I, I figure my, my theory around camera equipment is it's, it's obviously not the camera, it's the person using it. But then when the camera becomes, or the camera or the equipment that you're using becomes um, a limiting factor, as in, you know, I need a better lens because this one's not sharp enough, or this one's really not wide enough for me, as in that's what happened for me recently. I've got this Pentax camera, I've got this wide angle lens on it, but the widest I can go is 28 mil. 
and that's what this is shot on. And it's and it's great because it compresses a little, but for the wide angle shots where you want something, you know, bold in the foreground, you can't, you don't have that. And so I've really missed that. And so I, I bought on eBay um, a 20 mil lens for this for this camera um, that's arriving shortly. In fact, FedEx kindly called me tonight and said I owe them $370 for the duty. So um, it's been a while since I ordered anything from um, overseas and I'm not used to paying taxes and stuff like that. But anyway, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to having that. But I really don't um, have gear envy or want to upgrade anything in particular for now because I've got everything I want. You know, I, I mean, I've used it in a, like it's a superb system. Yeah, it's, it's very robust. It's very, it's reasonably lightweight for what it is. Yeah, it has a reasonable range of lenses and it's got great dynamic range. It's you know, the rest of it's just uh, a box that collects light and the timing, yeah. composition, and structure of, of everything has nothing to do with the camera. And a good no, image. no. And, you know, I have learned the ins and outs of it. Not that I think it's terribly difficult, but I know how it behaves. It fits like a hand in glove to me now. And so I just love it. I know, I know that we can, we can work together to get great pictures when I go out shooting with it. Um, and so I'm very comfortable with that system. So I wouldn't feel any need to, to upgrade or do anything else. You know, if, for example, I'm like, geez, when I go and blow that photo up to be two metres wide here in the gallery, the Pentax is not holding its own, of course I'd start looking elsewhere because I do want to be able to provide big artwork for people's walls. What are, um, what are you using the upsizing, to. Tom? I'm still bloody old school Photoshop, to believe it or not. I am using Go, uh, the Topaz um, Gigapixel AI technology um, for, for some of the stuff. Um, if I really feel that Photoshop's doing a crappy job, um, I find that sometimes Photoshop does a better job than the Topaz and other times uh, it's vice versa. Um, but a lot of the time, I, I'm just simply using Photoshop. Uh, do you find that on any particular kind of images that one prefers over the other or it's just random? Um, no, it tends to be, I think, more random. But, I, uh, but if I was to categorise one over the other from the tests that I've done, if you've got a lot of detail in the shot, uh, the topaz seems to work particularly well. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, like yeah, the, it, it tends to smooth out areas a little bit much if there's low detail, I find. Right. Mm. Yep. Yep. And okay. Photoshop's been greatly improved. There was a period of time there where it wasn't that great at upsizing, it, but they have massively improved it. Yeah. And now. So it actually does right. a, pretty, a pretty dang good job. I, look, yeah, if, if I felt that it didn't, I wouldn't use it. Um, but I, I find too that stitching pano... Um, drone shots from a pano or stitching photos together from my Pentax. This is actually a, obviously a single capture that I've cropped a little and we've printed this two metres wide and the quality is outstanding. Um, remember, I'm not really having to blow my pictures up heaps in order to get the size that I want um, here in the gallery even for artwork. So I'm not starting from a low base and having to upsize them tremendously. I'm, I'm starting already, already with a big file. So it's not as big an issue, I guess, as perhaps um, other people would find with um, with other cameras, so to speak. And you outsource your printing, Tom? Everything. Everything's outsourced. Um, we don't do anything in-house. Um, we just don't do the volume that, that would justify having a printer here in the gallery to be able to print from. We don't sell a lot of, you know, smaller prints that I could easily run off a smaller printer even. Um, we, we're, you know, three, we're in our third year now in the gallery and we're still... You know, we're still toying and playing and pivoting or whatever else you want to call it with what products we feel resonate with people. Um, the big art works really well, um, which we're providing a lot more canvas like this one behind me um, with a beautiful shadow box frame around it. That's resonating really well with clients. Um, it's amazing how much frame prints don't sell as much. You know, we still sell them, uh, but they really like the acrylic as in the, the face mount. Um, they really like the canvas with the shadow box frame around them and that's the only way we provide the canvas. Um, and so we do offer the four substrates, canvas, metal, acrylic and frame prints. So they have that choice, but they have that choice without it affecting the price as well. So um, we, you know, through my years of selling portraiture and running portrait studio and Mary's experience too, the less objections or friction you can create in a buying process means that hopefully people make um, a decision easier or will come to a decision at all. And so we decided um, a little while ago here in the gallery not to charge a premium for say acrylic or um, metal, even though it costs us more. And, and yet we would do the same price 
for the any photograph, the only difference in the price is the size. So if they come in and they go, oh, I really like that, but I don't want it in canvas, I want it in a frame print, how much more is that? Or how much difference is it? We say there's no difference. You just choose based on what you think is going to suit your home best. Because again, we don't want people compromising on the, um, the finish that they buy simply because, oh, that's cheaper, so we'll go with that, even though the canvas is not going to suit our home and it's going to look a bit crappy. That's our reputation on their walls. We want it to look amazing. And then people come into their home and go, oh, wow, I love that photo. God, who did that? Where did that? Where'd you get that? You know, oh, I'll go down to see Tom at the gallery in Main Street, Mornington. There's a referral for us. You know what I mean? It's best that um, it looks great on their walls. And the other thing that we do here at the gallery is that um, a few years ago, my poor old Subaru died. My Subaru Forester, I did about 240,000 kilometres, blew up an engine and then blew the whole thing up. And the debate between Mary and I was to whether I buy a seven-seater family wagon to carry all the kids around in or um, whether I buy a, a moving van, so to speak, a, a van in order to um, deliver artwork to people. And, and I actually liked it more from the ego point of view. My, my ego is only that big. Um, I wanted to wrap the van... Um, I should have a photo of it somewhere. Um, I wanted to wrap the van, you know, with with a picture and our logo, et cetera, to, to be a mobile billboard for the gallery. And we've done that and it's become very distinctive here on the gallery. People, we've won work out of it. Um, people recognise it. Uh, even before they come to the gallery, they go, oh, you've got that van that drives around everywhere, don't you? You know, oh, right, so this is your gallery. They see the van before they see the gallery. But the benefit of it also has been is that, as, as a service, as an added service, we actually do free delivery and installation of the artworks to people's homes, both here on the Mornington Peninsula, as well as in Melbourne. And, um, and we offer that service, you know, that would otherwise, you know, if I got a professional frame or hanger to come out and, and do that, that'd cost at least $300. And I don't want to charge the client that. Again, that's friction that may, that may cause them not to buy. But also, too, a lot of our pictures are quite large. You know, this one here is a metre and a half, for example. That's not going to fit in people's cars easily. And so we just say, no, we'll deliver it to you. We'll come and hang it and install it for you. And again, if it's installed and hanging on people's walls, A, they love it because, you know, that's what they bought. But B, it's advertising our business to their friends immediately rather than it sitting, you know, on the floor or if it's a roll print that's sitting in the cupboard and they 12 months later, they still haven't got it framed. That's amazing service. Um, well, it's just, yeah, it's just what we do. And again, you know, people love that. And, you know, we have competition here in the street and we want to make sure that we, um, we differentiate ourselves from that by yeah. saying, no, we offer that as a free, you know, as a free service. Oh, great. No, okay, good. You know, that can be the difference between them buying from us versus them buying from somebody else. Yeah, I guess, like you're saying, if you can remove as many of those sort of hurdles that, that um, people might have, then, um, you know, that, 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 I guess, reduces the number of excuses to not buy it. So you just, you just got to make it easy to buy. I remember reading a book on Amazon years ago, years ago um, you know, when the internet was first starting, where Jeff Bezos said that he wanted, you know, two clicks before you hit the, from the homepage to get to the cart. You know, like literally you find what you want on the homepage you'd, or search for it you'd go into the next page, which would show you the product. You add it, you click on that one to get to the product itself. And then you click it, add to cart, and you're like two or three clicks away from the homepage. He just wanted it to be really easy to order so that people would order, you know what I mean? And it's the same deal with us. Yeah, and I like the, uh, there's definitely that philosophy to around choice. And um, sometimes it's actually a bad thing having too much choice. And so if you can pair that, I think it's the magic number six or something, or, you know, if you've got, more than too many choices then yeah. people just uh, end up getting overwhelmed and don't do anything so I'm, I'm amazed on on other photographers websites and i'm not going to single anyone out in particular that you know they offer you know six ten sizes of framing or for sizes of the print and and they're all in inches which most people don't understand photographers understand inches but then you know most people deal in centimeters our our rule of thumb is that you give them three options and that's it we have like a small, medium, large, and if they want something different, they can order that because everything is custom made anyway here in the gallery. We don't have stock out the back and go, all right, let's go and grab one of those and, and there you go, take it home with you. Everything is custom made at six to eight weeks delivery time. And it just means that if we're custom making a certain size for somebody, we can do that. 
But we really just give them three choices and we say, well, look, there's the small there, there's the medium there, and that's the large there. We just take a pick. If you offer them too many choices, they just can't decide. Yeah, and then they don't have to think about all these numbers and, you know, what that all means. And it's just all, um, yeah, there's there's no, it's, it doesn't sound as complicated. No, no, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, again, you know, like for a photographer, we're visual artists. We can often look at a photograph in an art gallery perhaps or somewhere else and go, yeah, that would look great on my wall. That's the right size. Most people don't have that ability to look at something on a wall in one environment and transpose it to their environment and decide whether or not that's suitable. So, again, another service that we offer is that we can come to their home and do a free um, consultation where we'll take photographs of their walls, we'll talk about their furnishings, what are they looking for, what mood do you want to create. We'll take a photograph of their wall and then we'll superimpose the photograph that they love from our you know, gallery onto the wall and that way they can then um, decide before they buy. You know, we, we scale it at the right size. It's obviously the colour um, suits well with the furnishings, etc. So literally if they love what they're seeing on the computer screen, they're going to love once we deliver the artwork mm. to them as well. So it's a, like a try before you buy. That's fantastic. Yeah, hmm. Very, very innovative approach and very customer centric, I suppose, as well, which is very, you know, it's where you really want to be to, to um, create that satisfaction and repeat buyers and good referrals and that kind of thing. So, yeah, 100%. We work pretty hard for our sales. And, you know, when you think to yourself, well, you know, I've spent 25 years photographing Australian landscapes and this is the, this is the end result, you know, a gallery, which is what I've always wanted. Um, you know, you, you don't want to, let yourself down in any particular way. At the end of the day, you know, you've, you've worked hard. This is the pointy end of the, of the game, so to speak. You know, this is the 20, culmination of 25 years has led to this point in time. Um, so you don't, wanna, you don't wanna stuff it up. Mm. And it's not easy to make money out of landscape photography. I mean, from a commercial point of view, it's crazy to think that you'd open up a gallery on a retail strip like this. There's about 200 shops here in Main Street, Mornington. Um, and, and you've got to rely on the right person walking through the door who likes your artwork on the wall, who likes the price, and then says, yes, I'm happy to buy it. I mean, there's so many hurdles, so many factors, so many things that have to line up for that sale to occur that if you thought about it long enough, you'd probably just go, you're bonkers. You're bonkers mm -hmm. even wanting to sell your artwork, you know? But thankfully enough, people do walk through the door and um, they like what they see and they buy, which is great. I just got one more question on that. Um, do you deal with the A sizes at all? Like, um, cause they're, they're probably also a bit more easy for people to understand or you just um, have like certain centimeter size. We don't cause even then I don't understand what, if somebody said to me AO, I wouldn't know what that means. And yeah. so if I don't understand it, I just presume that my clients would need that. If they yeah. started talking in that language, I might, I'd, you know, right. Bring it up on my phone or computer and start transposing it to centimeters. But most of the time, I've got a tape measure here and, or I'll go over to the client's house and, and go, right, well, you know, if it was this wide, is that, is that going to work for you? And I hold the tape measure up on the wall and they go, yeah, no, that looks about the right size. Or you can even um, get pieces of just um, little thin strips of electrical tape and you rip those off two pieces for a corner, a corner here, a corner there, a corner there. And you put that on the wall and they can see the outline of the size of the artwork right. that's going to yeah. take up that space. And um, that way that can satisfy them as well to know they're making the right decision. A lot of the time they're just really unsure about what they should be doing, as in what's going to be the right piece to suit our home, what's going to be the right size, what's going to be the right finish. So I just treat it as a game of just trying to solve their problems as easily as possible. And that way they're comfortable with the decision, they trust my judgment, and then they love the artwork. And besides, we do offer a 30-day 30 30 money-back guarantee Literally, if somebody ordered an artwork and they, after 30 days, said, no, nah, it's just not working for me and I don't want to swap it over for anything else, I want my money back, oh. we, do, we do that as well. We, we, don't, um, we, we don't shirt on that at all. I had that happen um, just only recently, first time. Big yeah, piece of, a big piece of art. She, I hung it in the home. Um, she was probably one of these people who is, is indecisive anyway. So she came in with a friend. A friend convinced her to buy it. She was happy to make the decision. She bought it. It hung on a mural for a couple of weeks. She called me. In fact, she'd come into the gallery. She said, yeah, I'm not 100% sure on the colours. And I'm like, 
all right, okay, well, we can swap that over for you. Just let me know. I want you to be happy. A couple of weeks later, she ran back and she said, no, I'm, I'm just, it's not for me. Um, I, I, and I said, like, do you want to swap it over for something else? She said, no, I, I'm just happy to have my money for now. And I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. I mean, it, it hurts. And you're like, and you're like, bugger, I really don't want that to happen because sometimes you just, you, you need that money in your bank account. And you, then now you've got a print or an art piece that you've got to try and sell somewhere else. But, um, you know, again, it just gives people the peace of mind that they're, even if they do make a wrong decision, <coughs> that it's not, it's not going to, you know, yeah, we don't be want with them forever. Up on the wall going, oh, bloody Tom Putt, I have to see that thing every day now. Well, yeah. you know, we hear that from other people. That's the problem, right? We hear that from the other people who come in and they go, oh, we bought a so-and-so and we, and we hate it. We don't really like it anymore and we want to replace it, you know. For whatever reason, whatever decision they they chose, most of the time it's people buying um, wall fillers. I call them, which is you know IKEA Harvey Norman crappy canvases that cost bugger all because they come straight out of China, and and you know they spend five hundred dollars on them, and then they walk into the gallery and go, ah, oh, wish we'd found you earlier. This is much better than all the stuff we've got. You know they could have put five hundred dollars towards a nice piece of art rather than. $500 towards a crappy wall art filler that they're going to chuck in the bin in 12 months time because it's faded and it's wrinkled and the frames come apart and all that shit. I just, it annoys me. It frustrates me. I know there's a market for it, but then I just want people to buy good art. You know, I, I wish people had the same taste in art as what I do and my clients do. Not that to say that I have an amazing taste in art. Don't get me wrong. I'm very particular about what art I'd hang on my walls. And most of it would be obviously landscape photography, but um, I just, it just frustrates me that, um, that people go for that crappy stuff rather than the good stuff. Anyway, so that's my It's just problem. so price-driven at the end of the day, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and, and we've got to make sure that we don't fall into that trap, even, even with my workshops. You know, like we offer a premium service and we want to charge for that. We, we can't cater for everybody, although as much as we'd like to, we'd love to be able to have everybody who wants to come on a workshop come on one. But we can't price ourselves that way because then I'm out of business. I don't make money. The same with the artwork, you know, like we, we can't afford, generally speaking, like this is a good tip I want to give everyone watching tonight, is that if you're looking to sell your art, as a, regardless of whether it's at a market, over the internet, through a retail gallery, um, et cetera, you've got to generally times the cost price by, by three, three in order to get the price that is, is going to cover other things because what people tend to do, and I've been guilty of this too, don't get me wrong, I've learned the hard way, is that they tend to get something printed or printed and let's say printed. That's the worst because print a print itself times it by about eight to 10, the cost price, and that's the price you should be charging. That's what we charge. You know, um, printed and framed is different because people go, geez, that framing was expensive. I'm really going to have to charge more for this in order to get my money back. Yes, you will because framing is expensive. But generally you have to times it by three to get, to make it worthwhile because what you've got to factor in is all those other things that you don't see. It's buying the next camera. It's paying the fuel in the car that got you to that location. It's buying the insurance, whether you've got, you know, um, insurance specific for your camera gear or whether it's home and content insurance. It's buying the internet, you know, the internet connection. It's buying the, the $30 a month that you pay for your web hosting, all that stuff, you know, write all the things down regardless of whether you think it's significant or not, that go into making up you capturing that photograph. You left the hairdresser off the list. Of <laughs> <laughs> I know. No, look at that. That cost me a lot of money. No, it doesn't. Oh, I bet Mary's had a few goes at it over the she years. She did. She did. She's had a few goes at it over COVID. Can't, can't, well, no, she's done a great job. It's when I get into it myself that's a problem. But, you know, it is a lesson that I've learned the hard way. You know, you, I don't want to lie awake at night. I will never lie awake at night wondering... Um, lamenting no let me say this i'll never lie awake at night saying geez i think i overcharged that person because us as artists tend to undervalue ourselves and we tend to think we can't charge that much i'm not worth it oh, oh god hold on that that the cringe factor we call it i call it if you're if you're not cringing at the prices you're charging you're not charging enough if you think that's a reasonable price you're you're down by about 50 percent double the price you know what i mean um You'll be amazed at how much money is out there and what people are willing to pay for a good quality product. That's that's my sort of rant. 
for the minute. Because uh, there's always yeah. the two approaches, isn't there? There's the high, the low price, high volume, or the you know the of high course. price, low volume. So of course, that's basic economics. And yes, you, you can fit into one camp or the other. Mm. But again, you know, like you're not going to do yourself any favors by undercharging what you're worth, because again, you're just gonna you're gonna go backwards pretty quick, damn quickly. You know. Not, not everyone has to be making a million dollars out of photography. And in fact, very few people do. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I don't want to lie awake at night going, geez, I'm, I'm not really charging enough and I should have charged more. And, and you can never recover that cost or that, that, that shortfall. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in a hole and, and, and it, or it becomes less enjoyable because you're saying, oh, I'm not really feeling you know, valued because I'm, I'm not getting enough for my artwork. I'm not people aren't willing to pay for it well they are you're just not finding the right people a lot of the time so we can talk uh, about that forever the um app is running a a three-day very affordable set of workshops and one of them is russell hamlet talking about exactly that right you know like just backing yourself and self-belief and you know, I'm actually quite interested in, in and I met Russell a few times and he's, he's not short on self-belief. Yeah, right. Well, that's, that's a good, good lesson. So he's learned, put it into yeah. practice and he's walked his talk and he's had a hell of a mm. successful career. So I'm sort of at one of those stages where I'm sort of feeling like I could do a bit of boost in that regard or, or that extra confidence to finally take that step that I'm already considering taking. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's in the next couple of days. So yeah. All right. Awesome. Like, oh, Thanks like so much for all those insights well, Tom. Three it's days. Every day you get someone that runs a gallery that sort of opens the, you know, that opens up to those kind of things. So we do appreciate that. And it certainly is food for thought, maybe more so for those that are looking to, to become professional down the track or, or look at selling their own work. Um, so it's always great to have those insights because they are pretty rare these days. So, yeah, great. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, a sort of an oversharer in that regard. Um, I just like passing on my knowledge and experience. And, and when I teach that and pass on that knowledge and experience, I'm coaching myself at the same time. You know, like I'm like having a, a good old stern talking to. Tom, take yourself out the back and give yourself a good lashing. You know, <laughs> it reinforces what I'm doing is right, you know, and, and, and so I, I get, you know, benefit from that as well. Yeah, cool. We should look at some more pictures, shall we? Yeah. 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 You no, know, this is um, this is a, a shot that I took many years ago. Um, just just remember that I've been shooting here on the peninsula for over twenty years because I grew up in Melbourne and we come down here for, you know, just shoots and and and, and anything else. And so this was a shot I did. Um, these are channel markers off the off the Rye boat ramp, for example, um, uh, that I shot on a day. I, I'm one of these people that if I'm shooting the water, I tend to either like it dead still or really rough, nothing in between. And this was one of these sort of in-between days. So I put the camera on a really s- slow shutter speed. I think it was probably using an intra-density filter and just blurred it out quite nicely and just went a bit pop arty on the um, channel markers there. And, and it's all, it's got a very painterly feel to it, which I really love. So we've printed that in the gallery before. Cool. One, one of the, um, I'm gonna show you some really interesting spots here and some of them don't exist anymore. We've had a, quite a bit of erosion through the years that I've been living here. And two of the archways that um, were here on the peninsula have since disappeared. And this is one of them. This is a place called St. Paul's Beach in Sorrento. This whole archway here collapsed in winter a few years ago um, and has blocked this off completely now. And in fact, they've blocked off that whole um, beach. You can't get down onto this beach anymore. So. Unfortunately, that's not available anymore, but it was a spicky little spot for a little while there to go to. Um, right near that spot or, or a little bit further on the beach is a place called Sierra Nevada Rock. So a shipwreck is called the Sierra Nevada um, beach wash there many years ago. This is just inside the Point Nepean National Park. Um, at low tide, it's accessible and, uh, and you can, at, at a certain time of year, like here, you can um, get the sun shining through this hole with some beautiful light rays. And in fact, you can get down close to this rock pool here and shoot some shots with this archway um, or this rock formation reflected in the water. And you've got this stunning mermaid's necklace here. Look at this. Look at the light shining through this. Mm, it's, um, it's unbelievable. So it's a beautiful little spot, but it's only best at low tide um, to get that shot, for example. Um, you know, you can do heaps of drone stuff, jetties, piers, etc., etc. This is this is a, a pier called the Zigzag Pier. I call it the Zigzag Pier. Um, it's quite insta famous now. It's at a place called Shelley Beach down in Portsea, and um, and and I if I have a shot of that from the ground, I'll let you know. But I've I've never really found something I really really like of that one. 
it's 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 really nicely done when it's um it's winter and it's really grey and overcast and you can get a really nice black and white shot of that, for example. Great shadows. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, the shadows. Uh, yeah, again, you know, this is probably. Let me see. Yeah, this was taken in October. Um, you know, you wouldn't get this in summer because the sun would be setting too far around with the south and you get a dirty big shadow here. And in fact, in, in June, this would probably be better because the sun would be coming sort of setting from that top mm -hmm. left-hand corner and you wouldn't get this shadow on the beach. So that's an example of sort of some of the stuff that you can do um, at certain times of the year. Speaking of shadows, this appeared in the, um, in the latest book where um, this is the right pier shot very late during a summer's evening, heaps of people walking along it. These are the pylons underneath the pier. This is the shadow of the pier itself with some kids swimming. And then these, these long horizontal shadows here on the left are the people's shadows themselves. Oh. So that's what you're kind of seeing there. If you, if you added a whole lot of more black to the photograph, maybe they'd show off even better, but. Um, that's the drone one, is it? This is a drone shot here. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's kind of wrecked it. Um, this is Point Nepean from above in a plane. So there's the heads, there's that um, ocean or that wave break that Paul was talking about at the start of the presentation. This is the um, this is what they call the, uh, the quarantine station. So this is part of the old sort of uh, quarantine station where they used to, um, uh, migrants used to come in through this, this port, so to speak. And um, there's old sort of um, gunners, you know, uh, turrets and all sorts of things here. And, and tunnels that you can walk through, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the road that takes you all the way out to the end. It's a specky spot. And, and all the way over here is, in fact, Gunnamatta Beach and um, Dragon's Head and all that sort of stuff. But is, this, that, is it kind of pretty limestone down that end of the Yeah, thing? yeah, really. Yeah, all, the, all that coast is pretty much the same like that. Yeah. I remember surfing quite a few of those little sort of gullies and reefs and finding out the hard yes, way. The hard way. Stone underneath. They're, they're frigging sharp. Yeah, oh, 100%. Man. Yeah, well, and this shows you the contrast between the two. I always hate the colour in this photo. I've just never been able to get it right. Um, the difference between, um, you know, I, the back beaches. With, with drone photography in general, do you? I've, well, Scotty this was is, saying he uses capture and he gets, a bit, he gets a bit of feel on the colour for, for the Mavic. I don't know what you think. Yeah, this is, a, this is a plane shot rather than a drone picture. And yeah, I, okay. I think I really need to visit the, the, um, the raw file again and just... Uh, and just have another go because again i've never been able to seem to get the color right i've just had it some warmth there and stuffed it up again but um this shows you sort of the front beach and the calmness of those waters compared to the back beaches here which cop you know battering from the southern ocean and uh and the wild winds etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh this is sort of the area that i'll be hitting up come the winter time to get shots for the winter book so that's so that sorry that shot there is is sort of from up high but as I as I shown you, say here, this is a down low shot um, taken with a drone, um, you know, and you can see the difference. The green's a bit too pop arty there. But this was taken a few weeks ago during the summer where we had this amazing mist, you know, sea mist, uh, yeah. much like I've seen down at the Twelve Apostles as well, where you get that contrast between the fact that the ocean is still cold versus the um, versus the, the heat of the land and when they collide it creates this beautiful mist and fog. It's just bloody glorious. Have a look at that. You know, really nice. Yeah, it's stunning. Yeah. It's a great that, little, a stitch, I assume, Tom? That is a stitch, yeah. So what are, how many pixels across are we there? We're, we're still only eight, eight and a half thousand pixels, so not a heap. This is another another shot, sort of the opposite angle, but sunrise rather than sunset down here at the point of pan. Um Point one star lighthouse over here, and this is the gap. This is the heads. So that's a, a nice little spot to go to, so to speak. Yeah. Um, what else? I'm conscious of the time here, guys. We're going for about an hour and a half, but I do want to show you a few oh, other no, spots. Got, still got a fair bit of time, Tom. So don't right. Worry. Okay. Um, there's a couple of uh, really interesting rock formations on the back beaches that have taken on certain names. There's three in particular. This one here is called Rabbit Rock or Bunny Rock, as you can yeah, see, the rabbit ears yeah. here. Uh, this is a late afternoon, um, very late afternoon, uh, almost nine o'clock during the summer shot, um, four seconds at ISO 100. I should keep that up permanently for people to, I know lots of people like seeing that sort of stuff. Um, you know, this is, I love shooting this time of year down on the peninsula because if you get a really beautiful, warm summer's evening, that afterglow in the, in the sky 
creates the most amazing color. So this is shot after the sun's gone down. You can see the lack of shadow, harsh shadow that shows you that. And then if you wait probably 20 minutes to half an hour after the sun's gone down, you can get a really stunning magenta glow that comes back into the landscape here down on the peninsula and other places, I'm sure. And that's um, that created that beautiful warmth in the picture there as well. So um, I love shooting um, that time of year. And if you can get an absolutely still evening down on the back beaches, which hardly ever happens, it's yeah, the best, best place in the world to shoot. This is another shot um, nearby there. This is a place called um, 16th Beach, which is where Dragon's Head is at. And this is where Lizard Rock is at as well. I haven't got a great shot of Lizard Rock. Lizard Rock, this is a, a tricky place to shoot because Dragon's Head is best done on a tide like this where it's low tide. But then Lizard Rock, which is this one here, which they're not far apart. They're like, you know, 20 minutes walk, 10 minutes walk. This is best done at a high tide because then the water comes up, as you can see by this tide mark here. The water comes up and swells around this rock, which makes for really interesting photos. So you kind of got to be there both a low tide and a high tide to get the best of both of these. Um, this is um, Cape Shank Lighthouse in the background here, for example. Okay. Uh, this is taken with a, a 70 to 200 mil lens, I would think. Great lead in from the corner with those footprints too. Normally you're annoyed yeah. by that, but it really works. I actually really like that. Yeah. And, and in fact, we just recently sold this as a two meter wide acrylic to a client who's building a house here in Melbourne and they loved all of um, all of this for that reason. Yeah. Um, and in fact, Paul, guess what they bought as well, mate? For their yeah, other room, they've bought two, two, two meter wide acrylics. Remember when we went to that spot in Karajini on that day off or the, before the participants arrived, um, I call it hidden pool. You go down in a Hancock Gorge and you go right rather than left. Yeah, to the right, we yeah. All the way up to the right through all that reedy stuff. We swore we were going to get bit by snakes and everything else. Um, <laughs> yeah, they bought the picture from there, which is pretty damn cool. Yeah, um, great. Yeah, super Six excited. Meters. It must have a bit of wall space. Yeah, they've got, they've got a big house. It's, it's bloody nice. It's coming on really nicely. So well, I, I mean, that's, that's one element, Tom, I've, I've often wondered. Like if you... Who who has that kind of level of the wall space? You know, like is when you're offering. There's some big houses, size, it's big like, houses this way, and also too, there's two types of clients that we deal with. Um, ones who have renovated or done extension, and they've got a lot of wall space because they've got a big open living room, or they might even be people that have moved from the city and they've bought like a duplex, like a you know two houses on the one on the one block, which happens a lot down here as well. A lot of developers are doing that. And so they've literally got one shared wall along the one side of their house and that one shared wall has no windows, of course. Right. And you walk along that hallway and you've got rooms off the, the hallway, but then you open out into this big living room in the back that's got, you know, a couch, a TV, a, a dining table, um, a kitchen, etc. They've got like 10 metres of wall space. They literally walk into the gallery here and we've got a 12 metre wall on one side and a 10 metre wall on the other. And I say, well, how big is the wall? And they go, yeah, about that long. And I'm like, Jesus, how are we going to fill that? Like um, maybe not all with my art or maybe not all with art, but, um, you know, we do have big clients with big walls that need filling. So and this is Dragon's Head, of course, um, made Insta famous um, over the years. Um, this is a, you know, a, a more moody sort of winter, I guess you'd say, shot. Yeah, this was taken in April, um, sort of that blue hour. And uh, this is a very specific um, place to go for a very specific tide. So you can't just go there at any time and expect it to look good. This has got to be on a tide which is at 0.5 of a metre or a little less than that. Now, what happens is that the water comes from, crashes against the rock shelf here, and, th and then it's got this gentle slope and the water that crashes against the, the rock shelf there pours gently over this rock shelf here. Now, if the tide's too high, of course, you don't get that difference between the, the rock pool here and the rock shelf. And it can in fact be too low where it's not the difference in that rock shelf height to the water level. It's actually the fact that now the waters are crashing in to the rock shelf on the right here. So there's no, no water spilling over here. So on a really big spring tide, which can get down to 0.3 of a meter, which is 20 centimeters less than what you see here you'll actually get no water pouring over the top here like this. So it is a really specific, um, really specific tide. This one here we've sold a few times. This is here in the gallery sort of permanently. Um, and this is um, a sunset shot uh, uh, on that same 0.5 of a metre tide. And in fact, interestingly, 
that 0.5 of a metre tide only happens during the summer at sunset. Yeah. And, then in the, and in the winter, it swings around to only be during sun, sunrise. Huh. So um, you can only shoot dragon's head at either sunrise or sunset about 20 times a year on this tide. Now, half of those, 10 of those will happen during the summer and then 10 of those will happen during the winter. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So you really have to plan it uh, out. And really, I, I've, had, say, I've yeah. had photographers ring me and say, I want to come on your workshop to shoot Dragon's Head. And I'm like, well, don't come to that one because we're not doing it because that tie doesn't correspond with that date. You know what I mean? Or they say, I've met people down here that have flown from Sydney for the weekend to specifically shoot this because they've done their homework, but they want this photo and they know they have to be there at that certain time, you know? It's, it's That's where yeah. the local knowledge really comes in handy, isn't it? A hundred percent, yeah. And, and yeah. what I didn't say at the start of the presentation is that the Mornings Peninsula is, is very tide dependent where you go, re, pretty much regardless of where you go, other than the sort of front beaches. But these back beaches, even this shot, you've got to time this perfectly with the tide, otherwise it won't look like this. Now, this is a spot that I've called Zigzag. Um, we sold this one recently in the gallery. Uh, this is a little um, wooden groin, you'd call it, at a place called Balnauri, which is on the Western Port Bay side. Now, this is shot, um, at, no, it wasn't 5.03 in the morning. That's, that's probably, I've been traveling. This is 132 seconds at F-16 ISO 100. So this oh. is a very early in the morning where I wanted the light to be really low to get that slow shutter speed. Obviously I've got a neutral density filter on. I tend to use a six stop. And this mistiness is caused by the waves crashing, or not crashing, but just gently moving over the top of these. This has to be shot at high tide. If it's shot at a low tide, there's no water at all. And then sometimes you actually get it where, um, this is built to stabilize the beach because there's a very little beach here, right? And it easily gets eroded away by the movement of the water, obviously. Um, and, and sometimes you can go here and it's bare rock and it looks crappy. And other times you can go here and you won't see this pier at all because the sand's built up. So. Again, I just happened to luck this. I think it was the first time I went to shoot this and, uh, and ended up with this shot. Of course, there wasn't a lot of color in it being early morning. So I turned to black and white. And this is what I, ended up with. I guess that's the other good thing about living in places like this too, is you can sort of see how the beach changes and, and know if a particular shot's on or not. And That's it. Yeah, you know, and you get there and it's not looking good. So you go, all right, I'll go back another time. Yeah. You know, so to speak, 100%, you know, we're very blessed in that regard. Um, this is a shot um, underneath Dramana Pier. This has got to be one of the ugliest piers around because uh, it's all concrete. Um, but my, oh, this was actually inspired by a fellow photographer down the road from me here who shot a lovely early morning shot underneath this pier and, again, made it look sexy. And, uh, and I just went for something else. I'm still not 100% with this shot. There's, there's a lot of blown out highlight here. But I do like the spray of water here and the way the light's caught that. So I may end up going with that to put in the book. Um, this is just down the road from where um, the gallery is at a place called um, Mornington Harbour or Snapper Point. And um, this is best shot during the summer because um, A, the light and the, and the sun uh, rises from far to the right here. Yeah, this is in November. Um, uh, but also too, there's more boats out here. In the winter, most of these boats disappear. So this is well shot um, during the summer. And just to skip on to that, might have been a bit of Oliver's Hill before it was... Um... That's it. Yeah, 100% before they got rid of that, unfortunately. This is the same um, spot. That that shot that I just showed you there was taken from um, this this jetty just oh, here, God. down in here, looking looking obviously to the left this way. And this is a drone shot taken um, back in summer last year, uh, specifically for the new book that I published. And um, people go bananas with this. They love it. We've got it hanging in the gallery window almost permanently because uh, they it's a different take on what they normally see because everyone's usually standing here in the car yeah. park or along this area looking out to the um to the boats like you saw in that previous shot like this but instead they're actually seeing um you know a different perspective so they love that and you're seeing down here the Arthur seed and Mount Martha and along the coastline there that people love um I didn't mean to do that um this is another shot of the same spot that was taken on the same day or almost um looking straight down with, again, another, this is a stitch yeah. drone shot. Um, and what I like about this shot is it is, again, during the summer, but every one of these car parks is full. Mm. You see, with the trailers, everyone's, it's obviously yeah. a beautiful day to go out um, boating. 
and the, the car park's full. So looks, uh, looks looks strangely absent of people for all those cars and everything. It's sort of, well, they're all out on boats. Yeah, yeah they're all out. They've all gone out of the boats. Like they all go. People sort of feel about it. They all go snapper fishing this time of year um, in the summer. Um, this is a shot that I took during winter last year, during, in between lockdowns of a place called um, Safety Beach Jetty. Again, there's a boat ramp here where people launch the, um, their boats. And, um, and again, this is shot, this is good to shoot around this time of year in sort of the winter solstice because the sun sets right in front of the pier here like this. This is winter, uh, it's west obviously. In summer, it's setting all the way over here to the left. So you basically, you know, if the, if the sky is going to colour up and the clouds are going to look amazing, it's going to be out of picture to the, yeah. to the left. So, yeah, right. um, again, this is very sort of dependent on what time of year you're shooting at. And besides, in summer, this is all just covered with people and you won't get a clear shot. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that's... that's one advantage of doing sunrises versus sunsets as well. As is- 100% <laughs> there's not as many people around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's generally a lot stiller at sunrise. I'm yeah. actually really enjoying shooting at sunrise for this next book. Um, more so than sunset, I'm 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 going to nice still places for sunrise, and then when the wind gets up in the afternoon, particularly in summer, like you know the Fremantle Doctor in Perth, I go to the back beaches and to know that for sunset to know that I am going to get that sort of more moody, you know, atmospheric type shot. Mm. This was uh, speaking of sunrise. This was a sunrise in winter a few years ago where I was walking through the water for probably 500 meters or more. Um, all Do these waiters, Tom. No, no, it was just, it was unplanned. I just, at, you know, in bare feet, had uh, had shorts on. This was in the middle of winter. Yeah, yeah this was late. She's all good. 20, 21st of July. I, there was a bit oh, of shrinkage, oh, oh, I'm oh, sure. There was some absolute shrinkage going on there. Mary wasn't <laughs> impressed. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, sorry, this is, this is a PG show. Um, but, you know, again, you wouldn't get this <laughs> shot in summer because the sun's rising from here, right? The sun would be out of frame here. So, um I was just blessed with some really nice cloud that particular morning. Um, this is something you won't see often. Um, I've chartered a couple of few helicopters um, I still, recently. I, I can't believe I haven't done it yet, Tom. I can't wait to do it. Yeah, this is Western Port Bay. Yeah. And so um, just to sort of switch back to Google Earth for a I'm second. I get up for years. But yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, it's not something that I was really that aware of, but I got invited by a, a friend of mine to go on a helicopter shoot. She got given a by her partner, that's that's um, Philip Island. Yeah, she got given it by her partner who's a helicopter pilot. Um, and uh, and so she said, will you come up and um, you know help me shoot? And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'd love to. And um, this is this section just here, it's where I am by the way, is um, this is French Island. So a sort of a more farmland, rural area, um, not easily accessible, um, but we, we've hired choppers out of Cape Willemai and flown across here and then done some really interesting work in and around here. Um, there's some amazing tidal um, mud flats, et cetera, to shoot here. And this was a shot we did during the fires of summer last year, hence that amazing glow. Oh, so I was about that. That's why you've, you've got that look. Unique lighting. Oh, yeah. It was, just it was gorgeous, Tom. It's just amazing patterns. I don't think this is probably the best shot I've got or, in fact, um, some of the others who, who were sharing the chopper with me got as well. Like, it was just glorious. I'm not... Not sure I have. Is that the surface of the brain or something like that? What yeah. sort of tide would you recommend for that? Well, something pretty damn low. I'd have to look at the tides again and get back to you on that one, Paul. But yeah, actually, I should be able to switch out of that. I don't know. Probably wasting too much time on you. But um, I was going to switch out of that and see see if we could pull up something. See, this is the advantage of showing in Lightroom where you've got your catalogue running because yeah. you can go back and look at the raw files as well, which kind of exposes you as well because people can go, oh, right, so that was the original and you ended up with that. Like, how did that happen? Um, this, is the, this is this massive amount of smoke haze that we had last year oh, in the summer. Sick. Yeah. Yeah. So what date was this? This was the 27th of December, just after Christmas last year or the year before last. So you've got a huge amount of smoke haze. Um creating that look but as you can see here look these are all unprocessed some pretty interesting when you're shooting as you know paul and luke when you're shooting aerials and particularly lake air for example and you're shooting into the sun you get that texture and and it's and it's and it's kind of intuitive because you think oh wait until the chopper gets around the other side and i'll get some really yeah. great you know front lighting stuff and it like disappears it's like useless yeah, it just goes flat it just goes flat as and you're like hold on what happened there you know this is um this is quite glorious as well. So, yeah, this is not sort of something that I've seen a lot of people shoot already, um, but I'd love to do more of it. 
um, it's pretty pretty special, as you can see. Anyway, what come up with it, Tom? Yeah, man. You wouldn't yeah. You'd think it's so, something taken up to northern Australia when you saw that, not not down. Hundred percent. When I put these on on Facebook for the first time, I'm like, guess where this is? And people are like Kimberley, Darwin, you know, yeah. all the rest of it. Anything other than um, you know French Island or Western Port Bay in, in Victoria, you know, like so. It was a real interesting find and something that I'd again I don't feel I've quite nailed. Um, there's a few other photographers who've done this with me who's got some really interesting stuff from here, like. You know, look at this. This is just some sort of sandbar. Mm. I know you've done a lot of sort of interesting stuff, northern um, coastline of Tassie as well, Paul, and this sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of similar, probably not as spectacular, but, you know, just hidden gems, you know, where you wouldn't think twice. But I guess if you do a little bit of research on Google, uh, Google Maps, like like I've shown you, you can, you can pick this sort of stuff out. And if you know what you're looking for, you can see the potential in it, you know what I mean? Um, I was also going to say, Tom, the... Um, a lot of your beach shots are also a bit like um, you wouldn't really consider them being Mornington either. Like, say that one there, you'd no, probably think, oh, probably Sydney. Bondi, Sydney Bondi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people sort of go, oh, like, um, you know, like, have you been to Aquabumps and, you know, yeah. you know, that gallery there? And I'm like, yeah, this is like paying homage to, to, to Eugene up there. You know, he's, he's done it better than anyone else, but I'm yeah. kind of like lending, lending um, that from him, so to speak. And that's why... I, this, this actually formed the, the basis of this was the cover of the book, this particular photo itself, because I love the fact that it's got the little hint of bathing boxes here in the top left. It's got, you know, the beach pretty much full and then just all the people and the colour, et cetera. Although I do find that the, um, the colour of the water down here tends to go a bit green. So I do play with the hue a little just to change it and make it a little bluer um, for some of these shots in particular, because I don't want green water, I want sort of more blue water. Um, this is another example of where I've done that. This is a place called the Pillars where people go and jump off the rocks here into the water. Um, quite an infamous spot. This is this is the most amazing colour of water. It looks like something off the coast of Italy. Um, but no that's polarizer, Tom? No, no polarizer. Yeah, okay. Uh, just getting the light right, you know. Right. Um, I don't like shooting arrows with a polarizer. I've got them a lot of it, and I don't want to lose that. I, I do with my drone, but I, I never do out of a plane. So. Yeah, me too. Me too. My polarizer filter is actually on my drone at the moment, but um, and I haven't taken it off. But this is this spot here is just notorious for for kids coming down here. Um, there's nowhere really close to park, so they walk along the edge of the road, and it's a really narrow road. And then they come down here with their six packs of beer and then they get drunk and they jump off here and they hit their heads. And there's been Ugh. three or four instances this year of ambulances and air wing helicopters being called in to um, deal with people there, unfortunately. Um, I hate it when I do that. This is my most popular selling print here in the gallery, without a doubt. This was shot a few years ago um, from a light plane. It's the back beach of Sorrento. And this is sort of typical of... You know, on a great day, what happens down here on the peninsula where people go for a swim. Um, and I really had to pick the most perfect day out of the whole of that summer because if you get anything other than the most perfect day, you won't get nearly as many people on this beach. And, you know, that's not by any means stretch of the imagination. There's not a lot of people on that beach anyway. So, um, what but, sort of focal length did you shoot that at? Tom? Now, that was with a crappy lens that I had, and most of the shots were actually soft. It was a lens that I bought off eBay that didn't work very well for me. That's on the Pentax from a 180, oh, sorry, 180 to 160. So, you times that by 0.8, so it's what, like, you know, 135 mil, something like that, at that focal length. So, yeah, it's got a bit of compression to it. Um, they love it. We permanently have this hanging in the gallery. Sometimes we have it in canvas. Sometimes we have it in acrylic. Sometimes we have it framed. But whatever we do, we always have it here in the gallery because we sell that quite a bit. I can imagine people like walking right up to it and trying to work out what everybody's yeah, doing and enjoying yeah, the Yeah, and, and whether they're even in the photograph, you know, yeah. sometimes, stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is a, a spot called Mount Martha, South Beach. Again, this is really popular for boats on a, a beautiful day. And this was shot... Um, you know, as part of that um, book project that I did. Again, we just recently sold this to a real estate agent in Mount Martha, for example, that are going to hang this in their, their offices. Um, but if you provide a different spin on, on things for people, they tend to really like it, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, these were obviously drone shots of the ferry that runs in between uh, Sorrento and Queenscliff. And I didn't use all these for the first book, so I'm going to use one of these for the second book. Um, I love this one, although I, this is the cars waiting to get on the ferry and these are the cars coming off the ferry. 
on a on a better day, I would have picked it with all of these lanes filled, and then I would have picked it where all these cars are coming off because it really peeved me that there wasn't a car out there. I didn't like the gap between, and I was gonna I was gonna Photoshop it in, but I I decided not to. Um, oh, temptation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, here was this cruise ship coming through the heads one morning that I chased with the drone, and it was moving that fast the drone couldn't keep up. Um, but this yeah, right. was this was my shot to get. Um, Beautiful light. Yeah, it was just first thing in the morning. I just happened to be getting out there, and then I'm like, "Oh, that cruise ship's coming through the heads. Oh, if I get my act together, I might be able to get the drone up and play around with it." So, this was a shot from the pillars there. You know, people park their multi-million dollar boats and jet skis. Look at this. This is a multi-million dollar boat with four jet skis hanging off, five, six oh, jet what? skis hanging off the boat of it. The record here is something in the order of about 100 jet skis in the water at any one time. Oh, yeah. Unbelievably Been mad. Stories like that. Bad, bad shit, you know. just mm. uh, It really worries me when I go out um, swimming, you know, to do my exercise um, and seeing the jet skis around, I just like piss off. You, you've got all that ocean, all that bay to play with, and you, you want to do it, you know, within 20 metres of me. This is the Rye Carnival. This is sort of like an institution. Anyone who's sort of holidayed in the summer down here in the peninsula would have gone to the Rye Carnival just um, in the evening, you know, to, you know, eat fairy floss and junk and, and go on these rides and throw up. So this was a, a shot I did um, for, the, for the book project um, as well. Um, they have various swims down here on the peninsula. So um, this was from one uh, last summer. So this is called Follow the Leader. And... Uh, and so that, that went in the book as well. And um, and this is, this is you know, a better shot of Cape Shank because I really had struggled to find a really nice view of Cape Shank because you're, you're down in amongst these bushes down here on the yeah. right. So and um, sort of swimming in it, aren't you? Yeah, it's not great to get to. And if you go down the pathway down towards Popper Rock, you're kind of like down underneath it too much. Yeah. So this is one of the better shots I've got of this. I like it because you're at sort of more high level. I positioned the lighthouse against that dark background. You can see the, light, the, the cottages here, but then also you've got Gunnamatta in the background. That's that beach I, I walked along just the other night. So yeah, I, I do enjoy this, um, this, this perspective. And, and this is not far from there. This is a place called the RACV Cape Shank Resort. So we're looking at it from low, obviously. It's surrounded by a golf course and they've recently, re um, recently built this. Yeah, it's like a boomerang. Um, and in fact, um, I showed this to the CEO of, of RACV. How I know him was that I was at a photography function, black tie do, and I got put on his table, like literally sitting right next to him. And we got talking and he talked about how he loves um, flying planes. And I go, oh, I actually shoot a little bit of aerial stuff myself. And in fact, Mary, Mary stroked up the conversation and she was showing his wife. And her wife was like nudging Neil and saying, you got to see this stuff, it's really nice. The next thing you know, he gets talking to me and he hands me his card and he says, look, I don't normally do this, but here's my card. I'd like to stay in contact. And uh, in fact, I, I showed him this picture and, and I said that it was going to be part of this, this new book I was doing. And he ordered 100 copies of the book, Sight Unseen, from me just over uh, the phone. Oh, he just said, oh. I'll buy 100 copies from you. We'll put them in the rooms at the resort. And that, that, as well as another mate of mine who runs a real estate agent who bought another 100 copies, paid for the deposit on the book. You know, like during COVID where I had no money. And so um, they, I put their logo in the back of the book and, and gave them a good write-up and thanked them enormously. You know, it was just amazing. They, they funded basically the book project. This was nearby and taken on the same night that I took this one. I just had a little bit of drone battery life left. And I went, oh, there's a golf course near here. I'll just pop over there and see what's there because you couldn't see it from the ground. And this is the only golf green on the Mornington Peninsula and we have heaps of golf courses here right this is the only golf green that I've been able to find that has an island bunker inside of it there like that isn't that cool so this is actually a double green in fact so there's two flagpoles here you can see the uh, shadow of the flagpole yeah. here and the shadow of the flagpole here so it's a double green this this sort of darker green patch is from where they've been watering the green and it's a sprinkler on here and then you've got, if you look carefully enough, you can actually see each of the, of the rakes in the um, bunkers here. There's one there, there's one there, there's another one here, there's another one here. And in fact, that's the, the shot I have behind me here. So something, something a bit different. Again, that was one of those serendipitous moments where I was shooting for the, for the you know, resort and then, and then just popped the drone over the side there and got this shot and went, oh my God, that's damn cool. And that, 
that entered or ended up being a double page spread in the book as well. This is a more recent shot of a different golf course. Uh, one of the first shots I took for the more recent book where I had this idea in mind that I wanted to try and sort of illustrate the book as being more like this. There's so many people that love this shot that I thought, right, why don't I make the next book more like drone pictures, but not looking straight down, but looking up across, you know, being able to see this perspective in the background. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm, I'm trying to cope and, and the beautiful light, you know, like this is first thing in the morning. So my brief to myself for this whole next book is really, you know, late afternoon, early morning light, you know, sometimes shooting into the sun like this. I'm not sure if it works. Um, but then, you know, getting these beautiful shadows and other things. So this is uh, called Flinders Golf Course right next to the... Um, yeah, it looks like a leaching special in the making. Yeah, exactly. It does need a bit of HDR, HDR panel. panel. Yeah, so I probably will go back and reshoot this. Um, I don't mind that there's no colour. It's just that really bright highlight in the middle really becomes distracting. Um, you know, there's some really interesting spots around um, Point sorry, Western Port Bay on the other side there near places like Hastings where you get some interesting creeks and some of the most southern mangrove um, forests in the world, in fact. You know, typically mangroves grow in uh, more tropical areas on the warmer yeah, climates. Yeah. But, yeah, here they grow this, all the way down here south. So we've got these, these beautiful mangroves forests. Um, this is a beautiful remnant sort of uh, flooded tea tree area that right, is, is right next to a place called Balcom Creek. And they've got this walkway that ran through and I thought I'd just make that a feature. So that'll go into the next book. This is a magical spot. This is a place called Fern Gully. I'd seen these, I've seen on tourist brochures and things, photos of the Mornington Peninsula with these tall trees. And I'm like, where the hell are these tall trees? I, I didn't even think they were here on the peninsula. And then a client came in one day and were telling me, was telling me about this spot. This is a National Trust Reserve. And I went down there in winter, um, this last year and shot this picture. This is not the sun out. This is actually just a very early morning glow. As you can see, it's a long exposure, 15 seconds, but there was just this beautiful soft light coming onto this um, bark here. And so I shot this um, I shot this very early in the morning with a beautiful mist. And uh, again, we have this printed on canvas in the gallery. And because it's canvas, it's got this beautiful texture to it. And it's you'd swear it's a painting rather than a photograph. It looks quite amazing. So, yeah, we're, this is another spot from that same area um, a little bit later in the morning where it started to rain. Um, but there's some really beautiful remnant um, rainforest in there that's that's basically um, all being, you know, farmed now. But uh, there's a couple of the spots there where we've got some really nice big big um, ferns as well as those tall mountain ash. This is from the same spot. Uh, this is on private property. This has been in both of the books that I've published here on the Mornington Peninsula. Um, much, much of delight to the guy who owns this property because I actually stumbled across this by mistake. I was just looking, scouting for new locations and, um, and I took my workshop clients in there a few times and he came past one morning and said, oh, what are you guys doing here? And I said, oh, I'm running a photography workshop, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, you do know you're on private property, don't you? And I said, oh, look, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't. I didn't come through a gate or anything else. Um, I, I just saw the track and he was walking along. He's like, no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. It's just, um, you know, um, just wanted to make you aware of that and you're welcome to come on any time, et cetera, et cetera. So we've struck up a really nice friendship. And in fact, right. he, he actually knows a fellow artist friend of mine and their best mates. And so um, we've got this unreal connection. And in fact, when he said to me, if you ever you're in the area, he always says, this, if you ever you're in the area, we're home, just come on in, just come in in you know, just open the gate, come in, you know, have a coffee, tea, whatever. So I did this one day a few weeks back. I'd never been to his house, but I thought I'm going to take him up on the offer. I had Mary and I had um, Oliver, my son with me, and I, they wanted to go for a walk. So I took them through a walk and they're like, where are we going? And I'm like, oh, just come with me. Trust me. And I go through his gate and they're like, you can't go in here. This is somebody's house. And I'm like, no, no, no. I know this guy. I know this guy. We walk in the front door of this house and there's Bron and Jeff these two friends of mine that I've known for years, this artist friend of mine, they're having afternoon tea or lunch with these guys. We felt, I felt so guilty because we crashed their party for about two hours. Um, anyway, they were eternally grateful to see us, which was lovely and they were very hospitable. But um, Ted has this beautiful acreage here in this forest. I'm not even sure what these, this type of gum is. Um, oh, but I, that, yeah. 
No, I've not seen koalas in here. They're just not tall enough or they're not the right type of gum. This bracken fern on the sides can get as tall as you and I. I've never seen bracken fern as tall as this. It can get up to two metres high. It would be the best place to play skirmish or paintball or one of those things. You could just hide in that and just get everybody as they came past. Um, but I'd shot this once before and I'd shot some really nice pictures in here, but without the mist and the fog. And this was a really crappy morning one one morning down at Cape Shank, where we had this really low level cloud just blowing it across the peninsula. It wasn't a nice morning at all. And as I drove home, I, I bailed early. I'm like, this is rubbish. I'm not going to get anything. So I drove my car up the road and looked into the forest. Um, I couldn't see this forest, but I was looking into the trees and I'm like, oh, actually that cloud's quite low. I wonder what it looks like back in here in Ted's place. So I went back and retraced my steps from all the places I'd been before reshot all the pictures that I'd taken in the past and, you know, basically threw out all the old stuff and kept this stuff because it's far more, um, it's far more atmospheric and it's got atmospheric, far more yeah. mood than the, um, than the shots without the mist. And again, we have this on display here in the gallery and people just love it. It's on a beautiful canvas. Um, similar spots, you know, where you can shoot forested areas around sort of the back of, the back of um, Arthur's seat, that big tall sort of hill or mountain, if you want to call it, that we have here that overlooks the bay. This is one of the spots. This is another spot. This was winter last, winter last, um, where again you can get this fog hanging around till a low cloud. This was eleven o'clock in the morning, so this hung around till about one in the afternoon. This particular day, I was just going nuts finding all these spots to shoot. And this shot got into the last book, the summer edition book, which is really bad because it was taken um, on the thirtieth of June. <laughs> last year but it was such a nice picture that I couldn't help but include it and um, this is the horses that, um, that there's a lot of um, trainers uh, horse trainers here on the peninsula and they take their horses to do um, work along the, the beach at Balnowring every, every morning other than a Sunday I believe and in fact I owe this I owe this photo to a friend of mine Rhonda who the day had before had been down the beach taking these shots and they had the mist coming off the water and I'm like, oh, my God, that looks so cool with the mist. I've got to go and reshoot those horses again because I've never seen it like that. And, uh, and I went back the following day, same conditions, nice still day, very cold in the morning, mist coming off. And then I'm standing on the beach waiting for these horses to arrive because it was, you know, pre-sunrise. And I'm reading this sign on this post about these dolphins that come and swim with the horses. And I'm like... Oh, that might have happened in the past, but I've not seen that ever that I've come down here. Oh, like it's crock. so consistent they got a sign for it. What a crack, right? What a crock. There's no way that it would happen. Well, the next thing you know, I'm shooting these horses and then they're bobbing their heads up and down and these dolphins are swimming underneath in between all the rest of it. <laughs> I've got a whole set. It was so good. I've got a whole section on my website here um, that is just on, look, locations, um, no, themes, Balnaring horses. That morning... You know, I'm a pretty good editor of photos. Well, I could not. Look, look, this is all from that morning. I couldn't decide. Like, there's, there's shots oh, here. Yeah, there's other are. shots. There's other shots where it looks like a bloody look. It looks like a shark fin, number 10 here, in like that. And look at this beautiful light. So, you know, my background is as a sports photographer. Like, that was my first job. And so um, I just go into sort of sports mode when I see this sort of stuff. I know shutter priority, yeah, you know, five hundredths of a second, um, you know, the native composition comes to me really well. All of these shots are pretty much uncropped. Um, I just go into that mode of like, right, okay, I'm back in my sports days here. Um, let's go for it. And so there were just, some, you know, we had a beautiful sunrise and then that sun came up and just got the cracking light. I'm even shooting a bit more like this where I don't mind a little bit of lens flare in the shot. And with the dynamic range of the camera, you can easily bring out the shadows, things like that. So... Yeah, there was a that was that this all these photos on this page are just from that one morning. Um, yeah, glorious. We've we've sold that print a couple of times. This particular photo a couple of times now. Um, I, I, th I think I've seen it front and center in the front of the gallery. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's been in, it's been in the window, and every time it's in the window, people just you know stop and stare. And oh my god, look at the shark! And I'm like, no, it's not a shark. <laughs> oh right, look at the dolphin. You know, like oh. Like, did the, the, were the horses, like, afraid of it or something? And I'm like, no, they were bobbing their heads and loving it. This is from the top of Arthur's seat looking down over the bay. So if this was clear, as Melbourne skyline would be in the middle here. Um, this is taken from the ground. And I love shooting in this sort of light um, where you just get that, that, that really heavy cloud, but then it occasionally bursts through. And this is obviously a ship heading out, um, out, out of the heads there. So that's pretty neat. 
Um, pretty much seen mo most of it here. Um, you can get some really cool drone shots of surfers doing their thing. This was a recent shot I took down at, um, uh, oh, I've forgotten, down that way somewhere. And I'm exploring new places as well. This was a spot I didn't even know existed. This was only taken a few weeks ago um, with a drone at a place called Shoreham, which is on the Western Port Bay side. And there's this glorious stand of pine trees that have been planted probably years ago. Really nice little spot. Um, these guys were just surfing off the coast that morning. So I've got some really interesting shots there. Um, this is not far from where I am here. This is a place called um, Mills Beach. So on a really nice evening, you can get a beautiful glow in the, in the um, cliffs there. This was a kayaker going past on that same evening. So I captured a shot of him. Um, oh, this, is, this is sort of typical, you know, front beaches around this, this part of the world. This was only taken, um, yeah, like a week or so ago. Big culture of boat sheds, Tom. I'm sorry? Huge culture of boat sheds. Yeah, there's, there's over like 2,000 boat sheds around the whole of the, of the Port Phillip Bay area. Most people sort of know the Brighton boat sheds and that's about it. But there's, there's heaps of other beaches with them on here and they go for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, well, I, yeah. mean, I don't know anywhere in the world that just has has so many. Yeah, yeah, there's a whole I mean, lot. It's actually a big cultural thing, and, and it is done up exquisitely well, and they're kind of a bit of a oh, it's feather in the bow type sort of yeah thing to have in, in your repertoire. You generally have to be a resident of the shire that you live in, so you have to be a, a you know resident paying your taxes um, and or your council fees. And then you have to, um, you can't have like electricity running to them. So there's no power in them as such. Um, you can't sleep in there overnight. Um, you can only store basically your sort of summer gear and that's about it. And then also too, you have to keep them well maintained. So if they came along and said, look, that needs a paint job, you'd have to paint it. So they, they want to maintain the standard of the boat sheds there um, along that's the way. Very consistent when you, when you spend time down there. It's quite amazing. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're beautiful. Um, I love this shot. I love, you know, typically you take any sort of drone shots maybe during the middle of the day to get the colour, but then... Is that a windsurfer down the bottom? This top? is a windsurfer with the, it's just about to go out, although there wasn't much wind. But I love that. That makes the shot for me, that beautiful long um, shadow going into the corner there. Um, so that was very serendipitous. This is on the same evening the other night. Um, these guys look on some sort of like, you know, what do you call them? Those little round things that you tie off the back of a boat. Let's I just... Them. Love the shadows here, you know, and then this, oh, this yeah. ripple of the sandbar, and and in fact, um, yeah, this is this is the same evening. This is a sort of coastline. I can rotate this a little. Um, this is a sort of coastline you get They're around there as well, you know. Like have a look at that, just glorious. I've walked oh, all the way. Kayaker, yeah, yeah, and having the kayaker there's a bonus. You know what I mean? It's these little things, like all these four shots. Let me just expand this up a little. That'll kill the epileptics and watching. Um, but um, you know, like. What, um, one, two, three, four, five shots, six shots. This one here too as well was taken um, the same evening, you know, all in the one, all in the space of half an hour, you know, one back, one drone battery and there's six shots to include in my next book. So oh, yeah. that's, you know, you pick it, you've got to get the right conditions, right time. This doesn't happen all that often, particularly this summer. We've had hardly any great, great summer days, but um you know, you can just pick them up one by one. It's like sure, sure. And the planning really pays off too, isn't it? So you, yeah, you know. knowing knowing where to go. Right, yeah. it's gonna it's a warm evening. There's gonna be heaps of people down the beach. Um, you know, there's there's no cloud on the horizon, so I'll go down there within an hour of sunset, and I'll I'll see what I can get. Yeah, and I'm launching from a car park back behind the beach because I don't want to be down the beach. You get people standing there hassling you, whatever. Yeah. I'm just doing it very surreptitiously and and not not being annoying and everything. Yeah. Um, this shot. This shot here is interesting because this is actually photographed this way. This was um, one morning I was exploring a new area and there was some sandbanks off the, off the coast. So I went and had a play and I had no idea this existed and I had no idea that the tide was going to be good for it either. Um, but then when I came to process the image, I'm like, all right, I shot it that way. I know, but it looks like a wave, right? So I went, well, what happens if I just rotate it Oops, like this and I've now printed that to come into the gallery and uh, I popped that on Facebook the other day and people liked it. So yeah, there's my little sandbar wave, so to speak. So um, yeah, that's that. These are the sorts of little things like, you know, just when you think you've photographed everything in your local area, 
you just go exploring and you, you know, it's like when you ask a question, you end up with 10 questions from answering one question, you know, like it's the same deal. The more I'm exploring the morning's peninsula, the more I'm realizing that there's so much that I haven't seen yet, you know, and I'm still discovering. And I really, I really enjoy that, that part of living here. And I guess that's what's sort of keeping me sane as a landscape photographer, you know, in the last 12 months, even though I haven't been able to travel interstate, I've still been able to practice my craft and photograph. Um, so much to choose from there. I'm, I'm really yeah. impressed by the diversity of locations that you have there. I'm also just um, conscious of time. I don't yeah, know if you 100%. had a, the last ones that you just wanted to finish on. Yeah, and... I will. Yeah, 100%. I'm, I'm conscious of the time. This is the, the sort of short list uh, that I've got so far for this new book called, you know, the, the Morning to Peninsula Winter Edition, which I've not shot specifically for, but, you know, you could include photos of us from summer that, you know, look like winter. So I'm not yeah. particular that they have to be shot during the winter period, just like, you know, I threw that photograph in the summer book. Um, but people don't care. They love the book, right? But there are some shots in here that, um, you know, I've not sort of shared a lot, but I think will work quite well. And I generally... It's literal. It's more about the mood than... The it's the mood. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, like I've shown... What I, what I do is obviously create a folder here or collection within in Lightroom where I've, I've put, you know, winter edition. I've got these photos. And then, and then I'll... Um, lay them out in Adobe InDesign and because I designed the books as well that I do. And then I'll show them to Mary and I'll also show them to like Ollie. My son has got a really good eye and I've shown him, you know, more recently the shots uh, for the next book and he's gone, yeah, no, nah, it's not yours, dad. It's like, it's not your style. And I'm like, Jesus, Ollie, what's my style then? And he goes, I don't know, but it's just not your style. So I go, okay, I'm going to delete it. You know, like it's really good to run your ideas past a few people. Mary's very critical of my work. She'll, you know, she she went bananas for this one, for goodness sake. And I'm like, well, it's just a creek early morning, you know. And she's like, no, I love that. It's, it's It's got a great mood to it. So sometimes she surprises me with what she chooses, but she's not a photographer. So she gives me a really objective view on things, like as in, you know, I think without saying it, she knows what the general public will like and resonate with versus me as an artist who goes, oh, yeah, but this is super cool because, you know, like, I waited ages on that beach and, you know, like you don't often get up looking like that. She'll just go, yeah, I know, but I don't like it. So, okay, shit, okay, right. Delete. <laughs> the harsh you know? realities. It's the harsh realities of having a partner who's, who's your greatest critic, you know, but in a really good way. So um, I do run them past a few people. And then the other thing I always do too is um, I don't want to ever, it's the same as having artwork here in the gallery. I don't ever want to publish a photograph in a book that I go, yeah, actually that wasn't that good or I really don't like that. So again, when I come to edit the book and do the final sort of run through, I might have a page that's beautifully laid out, but if I decide that I don't like the photo anymore, I'll just delete it. Because again, I don't want to be here in the gallery and people you know, flipping through the book and then me just thinking, yeah, shit, I hate that picture. Oh God, I don't know why I included that one. Oh yeah, there's another one I didn't like, but you know, go out and shoot more and get more good pictures rather than trying to, you know, Fill the book fillers, with, yeah. Just yeah. fillers, yeah. I don't, I don't want fillers. And again, I want this to, I kind of want this to be able to look back in years to come and, and look at it and go, oh yeah, I'm really proud of that book, you know. Versus, oh god, that was a disaster. That book, I, I remember there were lots of shots in there I didn't like. And in fact, um, just to finish off, um, this is my 14th book, as Paul alluded to at the start. And I love publishing, and I love um, the printed book. I've always liked the printed book. Um, this is the only book that I've actually sat and looked through three times cover to cover uh, since it's been printed. Every other book that I've ever printed, I always, um, I always tend to sort of like open the box from the printer, flip through it, go, yeah, that looks about right, great. And the reason being is not because I'm embarrassed, but more that I've looked at the book so many times over the years of shooting, putting it together, changing designs, etc., that I know the book too, too well by the end. And I'm sick of it. Whereas this book, I think because A, I love that style of aerial photography now, and also two, it was done in such, such a short period of time, I really didn't get the chance to sort of get sick of or appreciate the images in there. Yeah, it was really fresh to me. So surprisingly, I, I sat down three times and went through this book cover to cover and went, oh yeah, that's a nice shot. Like it was like, it was like I was looking at somebody else's book. It was, it was very enjoyable, very gratifying because I've often beaten myself up for that. I've often gone, Tom, you don't appreciate what you're doing because you're too close to it or you've seen it too much. So um, maybe I need to do that in the future. Spend less time, you know, print, um, shooting them and more time producing them. 
anyway. Yeah. That's, um, Thanks for your time yeah. tonight, guys. I hope that was interesting. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, like I mentioned earlier, just really astounded by the variety of scenes that you have to work with there and the different, I guess, um, angles for sunrise and sunset and the piers and surfers and people out on the beach and you know, more than enough to, to work with. Molly's come to say hello. She's ready. She came, she, she's been very good. She's been down the back of the gallery here on her own, um, her own couch and then she's obviously heard that we're wrapping up. So she's come up to me and gone, right, Dad, let's go. I'm done. I'm done. Are you ready to go, Molly? Are you ready? You're not looking very comfortable. You want to go to the park? You want to go for a walk? Ooh. Go throw the ball? You want to get a kiss? Do I get a kiss? Uh, no kisses. Never work with animals. At <laughs> yeah, right. No, I really, I really enjoyed the insight. We, we had a, a good mix of, you know, the, the mindset around how a gallery works, that how to approach a longer project, you know, what people often come across later in their career when they're just taking part of the sake of photos. Isn't necessarily what gets you out of bed, you know, it's more about having a directed kind of uh, goal, I guess, as well, which, which, which I find, you know, Licky does a bit more than me. And, uh, and I'm, I'm sort of, that's rubbing off on me a little bit, you know. Oh, good. Yes, and, in a positive way. Mm. Yeah, you brought me back some great okay. memories from an incredible entry into Australia. That's that's what was my home when I first arrived in Australia for four months. And and it's really sat with me ever since, you know. A, a, a wild winter on the Mornington Peninsula 20 years ago was a special thing. Nothing better. Um, yeah, 100%. Yeah, and it really, it really surprised me. Um, its power and its mood and its breadth and its depth for mm. something that is kind of like Melbourne's backyard in a way. And uh, speaking of which, I, I actually got led up the back of Mount Wellington by uh, Lukey and Nick last week. And I, I live on Mount Wellington. I can't remember the last time I've taken a photograph up there. It might have been right. Ago. Yeah. So, Sometimes uh, you've got to be a tourist in your own backyard to appreciate yeah, it. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like you think if I came down there, I'd be like, oh, my God, take me up Mount Wellington, take me up every path you know, because it would all be new and fresh to me. And, and I think what I've learned from living down here is, as I said before, like I know so many places so well, but then they look different at different times of year, different light, different mood. But then there's so many places that I still am yet to find. And, and if I hadn't got my ass out of bed, you know, to go to that spot, you'd never know about it really. mm. so yeah it's 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 refreshing to approach it that way yeah absolutely. makes it interesting yeah. definitely um and i guess in this time and age um being local is definitely a, a good thing because you never know when <laughs> things just get locked down again and, and you have no choice so it's always good to um yeah i don't know whether i just it. threw away about five grand today but i had to pay a deposit for a workshop that i'm supposedly running at Caragini in wa in april Ooh. and i'm like am i ever going to see this money again are we ever going to get there it just seems so weird to be booking flights and booking trips when you know the borders closed or we've closed the border yeah. to wa it's just it's so uncertain it's so weird it's a very you know, it's uncertain time. times yeah for sure and uh, I, yeah, I just saw that I think 56 houses have just been destroyed near Perth. Mm. Fire, like yeah, right there's there. bad fires up in the hills there, so it's terrible. Yeah, they've yeah, been blessings on. I hope everyone's kept time of it over well. there in WA recently. So um, hopefully that, that all um, eases up there. But um, yeah, look, thanks so much um, for joining us, Tom. And, thanks, guys. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. Absolutely give, uh, give me a hug for me, mate. Yeah, I'll give it a Very inspiring, as per usual. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. And um, and thanks for the opportunity. And I hope you've enjoyed it and continue to do all your great work. You, you yeah, inspire no, me, guys. We're, we're, so, um, we get yeah, it so don't much forget. out of it. It's, it's hard to stop. <laughs> yeah, of course. We, you guys are doing a great job. You know that. And oh. uh, don't forget to visit Tom's gallery and have a good look at his latest oh, absolutely. book and the plethora, plethora of other books that he has. I'm, I'm still waiting for the snow one, Tom. Oh, so am I. Believe me. Yeah, As yeah. I said, it's finished. I'm just going to get... That's going to be quite unique, I think, in Australia in the Australian market. So, yeah. yeah, I'm really super proud of the work that I've done in that as well. Although, you know, I haven't been up to the snow more recently. Um, yeah, I've, I've put a lot of time and effort into that book and got into some pretty, pretty interesting situations that... Thankfully, Mary isn't here to tell you about. Um, the ski patrol have, have been called on, on at least one occasion. So 
um, you know, yeah, that'd be exciting to get that out as well. It's, um, it's, it's been a long time coming. So, yeah, come down to the gallery. We're in Main Street, Mornington. All the details are on my website. It's at tomputt.com. And you can find me on all the socials, um, Tom Putt Gallery on Instagram, um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, check the description of the video and we'll have all of Tom's details in there. Yeah. In the show um, notes. Website, the oh, show yeah, notes. Show notes. Um, Look, and also thanks to all the viewers as well that um, filled in the, the survey form. I know even Tom had a crack at it. So um, <laughs> if you haven't filled in the survey and, and it's sitting there in your inbox, um, please um, uh, feel free to fill it out and give us some feedback. And it all helps us to make the show better and more targeted to what you're looking for, uh, what you're interested in and things like yeah, that. Yeah, so, that's a great feedback so far. And it's actually already starting to shape the way we're thinking and feeling about this year. So. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, guys... and I got a lot of go-go juice, actually. Uh, we were pretty excited. We got a bit overexcited the last few days. <laughs> the right ideas you, are pouring out. You guys, you guys asked the right questions as well in that feedback form. That's what encouraged me to fill it out more than anything was like, actually, you're asking very good questions here, you know? And I think um, it gave a feel for where you want to head with this, whether it's the same as what you've been doing or, or, or something a little more tailored or I don't know, but you guys yeah, have I done think, a great job. I, mean, I, but... think, I think if Luke, you could keep that beautiful soft, filter on your face that's definitely a winner for 2021 yeah, no, about that. no i just did now come on there you go that's <laughs> gonna work on your stuff yeah oh look at me jesus this I, yeah i've not got the greatest skin i need some botox it's harsh, mate. It's harsh, yeah it's terrible i've got a box in there mate I've, i'm getting old mate that's the problem oh no uh, well, well, the new job. On that note, uh, <laughs> on that note, let's go. No, We've no, gone no, completely thanks, irrelevant, thanks so time to go. And, um, and um, we will be back um, same time next week. Um, until then, uh, thanks for joining us. And